Hey guys, here's the third installment of October's compilations. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons for supporting the channel. So big thanks to Courtney Maxwell, Alex, Monica Levelace, Gemma Allen, James Gorgono, Jody, Shan, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, Jill Hutchins, Elena Renee, and Linda. If anyone else fancies checking out my Patreon, or any of my other social medias, all my links are in the description. Anyway guys, enjoy. My story takes place about 10 years ago. At the time, I was living in a low-income apartment, which, in retrospect, wasn't the best neighborhood. Living there a couple of years, I learned how to deal with things. Always keep your eyes forward, never make friends with your next door neighbor, and last but not least, don't trust anything with a breath. Being in an apartment complex, I became enlightened by all the neighborhood's problems. Yelling, partying, crying, fucking, were the soundtrack. It sounded like the neighbors were right in your living room. So, to eliminate this uncomfortable feeling towards my fellow dwellers, I started walking. The building I lived in was right next to a flood wall. A five minute walk up and walk over the wall, and it was all nature, trees, wildflowers, animals galore. I've walked this area so much, I traversed it at night, alone and drunk on several occasions. It always felt like a safe place. There were only a handful of people that would walk this particular wooded area. A couple of elderly people who seemed very nice, a few college students getting photos for the photography class. One day, I went out the door and made my way up the flood wall. The path goes up and over, then gradually into the wooded area. At the beginning of the tree line, there was a celebratory vine that I would swing on any time I passed through. This vine was big enough for a 98 pound girl to swing from, and some bigger people as well. I got to the vine and noticed it was cut, and the vine itself was just gone. I have been walking these woods for a good two years, every single day. No one ever messed with that vine. Honestly. It was so big it would be a hassle just to remove it. Seeing this gave me a very unsettling feeling, way out of the norm. Coming across many homeless people and drunkards in the middle of nowhere type situations, they never posed a problem, so I still felt somewhat safe. I moved forward like I had many times before. A quarter of a mile into the woods, there's a huge concrete block that's above ground, several feet tall and several feet wide. Twenty people could stand behind this block and never be seen, and no one knows why it's there. It was just a nice area to smoke some green and not be bothered. I arrived at the concrete block in the woods and casually walked around the back, leaning up against the concrete. I pulled out a lighter along with a joint. Now like I said before, this place was very familiar and never had any problems take place. To this day, all of that changed. I was about to flick my bick and light my joint when I heard the snapping of a branch. I immediately put my lighter and joint back in my pocket. This was not an animal sound. The scuffling through the woods was getting louder, and it was accompanied by two male voices, bickering back and forth. Their steps seemed agitated, and they weren't walking the path. Instead, they were just walking randomly at an angle towards the concrete block. I quietly and slowly peeked around the corner. The two men came into view, and I noticed they looked mean or pissed off at the least. Clothes torn and dirty looking, hair a mess. These two guys were not from around here. They looked 
looked out of place. Every second those footsteps got closer, my heart pounded even harder. I was doing my best to regulate my breathing and try to stay calm, but something told me that this was a bad situation. Eventually, they made their way to the concrete block, still arguing and placing blame on each other. I was quietly moving around the corners to keep them inside as they passed. Their conversation turned to the topic of replacing what they'd lost, very adamant to complete whatever mission they were on. I knew at this point I only had one way out, and that was the same direction as these two weirdos went. So I rounded up enough courage to quietly follow behind, this way, I could keep tabs on them. If they disappeared, they could be anywhere. So I stayed back enough to blend in with the daytime shadows and behind trees. I followed them, being careful with each step, hearing more of their very morbid conversation. I gathered that they were part of a human trafficking ring. Their only job was to randomly kidnap people of all ages, male or female. The market is evidently widespread and has many different preferences. Reality really started to sink in then. The acceptance of how this was going to end was set in my mind. I knew what was going to happen if they caught me. So I saw a small opening in the tree line up ahead and decided to make a break for it. Adrenaline had started to build up. I had to make this count. I paused for a few seconds and let the two men walk a little way further ahead before making a dash for it. At that precise moment, I jumped up and ran as fast as I could at an angle towards the flood wall. Almost to the top, I heard a commotion within the woods. It was those two guys. I heard them scuffling around, trying to make their way out of the wooded area cussing and getting more pissed off as they tripped and stumbled in my direction. I heard one guy say, get her, and that's all it took to get me motivated. Running even faster than before, my goal was to make it to the door of my building. Thanks to fear and adrenaline, I made it home safely. I didn't see those guys ever again. A couple of weeks after this incident, I went for a walk along the top of the flood wall. A little safer, and had a better vantage point. I saw something odd though. A lot of black smoke billowing upward. As I got closer, I realized it was a medium-sized car in flames. The whole car just engulfed, and the heat became unbearable. I took off running to the nearest payphone to call 911. A minute or two later, I picked up the phone and dialed 911. Before the operator had a chance to speak, I gave the approximate location and advised the operator that there might be someone inside the burning car. The operator, with no emotion, replied, We've gotten numerous calls about this already. A little aggravated, I asked if help is on the way. The operator calmly said, They'll get there when they get there, and the call ended. I waited two hours for the police and fire department to show up. It felt weird, like something else was going on. After everything was said and done, I wanted to know more about what had happened. A few weeks after finding the burning car, I decided to do some snooping, and what I found out came straight from the PD. There was a serial killer running amok in my little town. He was active for about six months, though his victims were rather peculiar. Each victim had some form of discrepancy, from big crimes to petty shit. There were between 30 to 40 victims. The victims were thieves, molesters, murderers, animal abusers. The list goes on. The burning car did in fact have a body sitting in the driver's seat. The person was deceased before the car was set ablaze. The victim was a mediocre drug dealer who was lacing his drugs with a lethal combination of chemicals. The killer always sliced his victims beyond recognition, leaving detectives to rely on prints and dental records. Here's the kicker. 
The two guys I had a run-in with in the woods were found a few days later, severely hacked to death, caught up beyond recognition. They were, in fact, involved with human trafficking. I could have lost my freedom or my life. This might sound a little fucked up, but I'm kind of thankful for him. After six months to this day, the murder stopped like he just disappeared without a trace. And that, my friends, is how I almost got kidnapped and how a serial killer took out my kidnappers. Justice prevails in one form or another. This is my story of how I, an openly gay man, attracted the unwanted attention of a straight stalker that finally came to a head this year, 2021. It all started when I was hired to a restaurant job as a host in 2010. I was 25 at the time and not yet accustomed to the giant rumor mill that is the food service industry. I, being the naturally friendly and outgoing person I am, decided to invite one of my co-workers out to watch football or just grab a beer. For the sake of privacy, we'll call him C for creepy. I approached C one day and asked if he was interested in hanging out. Of course he says yes, a bit too eagerly now looking back. But you know what they say about hindsight. As a rule, with all straight men I hang out with, I inform him that I'm gay, so if that's a problem, he has the chance to just walk away and leave the offer just that, an offer. I figure it's better that way, no harm no foul. C proceeded to tell me, oh no problem. He, like every other straight guy I know, has a gay friend or family member, one or the other I can't quite recall, as I'm almost 40 now, so it's been some time now since this occurred. So, I said cool, and we proceeded to set a day for us to hang out. About a week later, one of the female servers approached me and asked, Hey, aren't you and C supposed to chill? Totally taken for a loop, because again, new to the rumor mill, I have no idea how she even knew, as I never brought it up to anyone. I responded, Oh, yeah, sometime next week. The server in question continued to gush about how hot C is. Yes, folks, this is where I made a mistake, and harmlessly acknowledged his good looks, in a joking manner of course, the way most homosexual men do around women they feel they can trust. Turns out, I couldn't have been more wrong about that. The server giggles and walks away, and I continued with my day and worked until quitting time. The next work week flew by as there was now a convention in town. I forgot all about the entire convention and didn't really think about C until the day we were supposed to hang out. The day came and I messaged C to see if our plans were still on, to which I got absolutely no response, which kind of left me puzzled as to what was going on. Needless to say, he stood me up. But being the naive person I was at the time, I gave C the benefit of the doubt and chalked it up to his work schedule and that he probably forgot. I let it go, seeing I still had another day off. When I returned to work that Friday, I found myself being confronted by C's friends about apparently starting a rumor that he was gay and I wanted to turn him. Note to straight guys, stop this behavior. It's so creepy to gay men it would shock you to which I very promptly said no, that was never my intention. I asked who told them a thing like that. As it turned out, you guessed it, the Little Miss Sunshine server had totally twisted the conversation to make me look like a creeper. Later on, that same shift, once C got in, I pulled him aside and tried to clear the air so I could tell him what actually was said by both female server and I. C says, Oh, okay, just be careful. 
because rumors can start with the snap of a finger in the restaurant world. I said okay and left the interaction thinking it was all smoothed over, but like much of my assumptions at the time, I was wrong. So as the months passed at this restaurant, I noticed the environment becoming more and more hostile towards me and C playing these weird ass let's be friends games where he would ditch me at the last minute. What was once just a rumor at my location became a company wide thing. At some point, I got fed up with being the center of unjust hatred and not being able to move forward like everyone else because of some silly shit that happened over two years ago. I decided to cut my losses and quit and find a healthier workplace. It was at this point that things really started to get super creepy. I started to notice see it places almost every day and everywhere I went. At first, I just put it out of my brain thinking, oh, it's a mall, it's a public place, stop being so paranoid. But then, not only the mall, but the beach, a few minutes after every job interview I had at the time. Then a few days later, I would get a call from the same potential employer, stating that they went with some other candidate for the position. Again, I just let it go, chalking it up to a bad interview. This went on for weeks, to the point I was paranoid I would see this guy waiting for me in front of my house. Then one day, I got a message on my Facebook from an unknown profile. It said, I am always watching you. It did not instantly click or connect in my head that this would be C, because he was a rather vain person, so any profiles he had would be filled with pictures of him and his lackeys. But the message and what it suggested really put me on edge. Seeing as how I keep a pretty low profile, who then would be so concerned with letting me know they were watching me, and why would they? I let the whole message thing slip to the back of my head, and... As it does, time continued drifting by. Now fast forward to November of 2017, my mother had just passed away and we had her funeral, a lovely event at which friends and family gave their condolences and shared the warmest memories of my mother. That day, I felt my phone vibrating, letting me know I had a notification. Of course, I let it all pile up as I was preoccupied that day with something far more important than social media. However, once the night calmed down and I had said my goodbyes, and given all the hugs my soul could muster, I decided to clear my mind and check all of my notifications, thinking it was just people offering more condolences. I was right, that is at least, until I scrolled past a new message on Facebook from the same unknown profile. It read, I am sorry for your loss. Your mother seemed like such an amazing woman. At this, my blood ran cold. Who the hell was this? And why didn't I spot this person in the group of people at the funeral? Then, as if the person could read the question right out of my brain, I receive another message. I hesitated to open it. But when I did, my heart stopped. I know it's been some time, but just so you know, I am always there, and always watching you. I screenshotted the message, and I wanted to tell my father, but with him coping with the loss of my mother, I decided against it. The messages continue to come with every major event in my life, from the birth of my nieces to the eventual passing of my father, to the point I stopped opening them all together for my own peace of mind. Now here is where things finally came to a breaking point. I am now living in my own apartment. Whoever this maniac was completely slipped my mind. Life and medical issues I am still dealing with, and God knows the last presidential election here in America. Let's not mention the pandemic nutcase. I was not thinking of any of the events from the past few years. I was too busy sorting out my life. That is until I got a notification on my phone from Facebook that I had a new message. And when I opened and read it, 
I was scared shitless. It read, and I kid you not, now that it's just you in that huge apartment alone, why don't you let me in? I had barely wrapped my brain around who this could be and why they had been stalking me so long. More than how did they figure out my new address? When there was a sudden pounding on my door, an excessive ringing of my doorbell. My skeleton almost left my body. I jumped so hard. That's when I heard a voice, and a rather familiar voice at that. Yeah, if you guessed C, you win a million bucks. Let me in now. Of course, I did not open the door. I refuse to be that one black character in the horror movie that dies from something stupid. I yell at him through the door to, fuck off, I'm calling the police. He proceeded to say, why would I be scared of the law? They only shoot people like you. To this, I rolled my eyes and went ahead and phoned the law enforcement. The response was very quick as the dispatcher could hear the commotion in the background. As soon as I heard the sheriff scream, I'm telling you one more time to get down, or I'm using my taser on you. I heard a pop and electric sound, then a pained grunt, and someone crumpled to the ground. When the sheriff said I was safe to open the door, they were restraining C with cuffs to drag him to the car. The court hearing was last week, and it turned out, the truth was far more twisted than I originally thought. It came out that the female server was a girl I went to high school with that I apparently jaded in some way. I don't know what way. I honestly still don't remember her from school. This girl had been sleeping with C for the entire time this had been going on, even back to when the whole thing started at the restaurant. This girl's whole goal from the jump was to get even with me for whatever it was she claimed I did. I know how crazy it sounds. Just imagine living it. My head is swimming in shark infested waters, just recounting everything to you now. What did C gain from this you wonder? Well, as it turns out, he had a lengthy history of severe mental health disorders not even the server herself knew about. Someplace along the way, C took it upon himself to change the script. He was supposed to stop bothering me after I left the restaurant, but said he became fascinated with my life after a chance encounter with my family. According to him, we all just really looked so happy together, the way a family should. And that, he always wanted a family like mine. So he had started stalking me, so that it could be, as he put it, a fly on the wall of a perfect family. When asked how he knew so much about my life events as they happened, this is what he said. I have not worked for the last years, so I could follow you. So whenever anything happened, I was never too far away. He was served with a restraining order, preventing him from being within a thousand feet of me for the rest of his life. The judge also ordered him to get mandatory psychiatric help. It's funny, after all this creepy crap he did to me and the emotional stress he caused, I do hope he finds peace within himself. The female at the center of all this got off without any charges, as what she did was not criminal. It was, if you ask me. Last I heard, she's expecting a new baby. Hopefully the next generation of that bloodline will be smarter. As for me, well, I can't honestly say this has not affected me. I now find it incredibly hard to trust people now. Hell, I don't really even trust my therapist. I am strong though and have a lot to keep fighting for in life. So I do what I have to these days to cope and continue. I used to joke about how flattering it would be for a plain dude like myself to have a stalker. Not now though, that is really not a laughing matter. All I can say to boys, girls, gay, straight, and everything in between, if your spirit tells you something's not right, trust it. 
Yeah, that's it. I never thought, given the design of my life, I would be the leading character in a Lifetime movie script. But, it's all true. This story takes place in the winter of 2016. I won't mention names or specific places for me and my daughter's protection. We're in hiding from her biological dad. That is a story for another time. My daughter was around five months old or younger. I had just left an extremely physically, emotionally, and mentally abusive relationship. Once my daughter was born, I became overly protective. I packed everything and left the apartment I paid for because the other person would not leave. I found a room share online with a great roommate. The area was very urban, diverse, and had public transportation routes to everywhere you needed to go. I loved it. At night, the streets were lit and lively, so it was not the safest place to be at night. I was excited for a fresh start though. I found a cleaning job at night. It was great and allowed me to bring my daughter with me, which was wonderful after everything I experienced. I was too nervous to ever leave her. On a chilly night, around 2 to 3 a.m., when I had finished work, I got off the bus that was across the street from my apartment. On my way home, I stopped at a 24-7 fried chicken place to get something to eat before bed. I got my food and started walking the short distance home, maybe a two minute walk. My daughter was fast asleep in her carrier, strapped to my chest and bundled up. I always keep a knife or taser ready to go under my sleeves, and my keys handy to get in fast. Two men were on the opposite side of the street. I didn't really notice till they started yelling how cute my baby was. They crossed, asking to see the baby. I did not answer. I just kept walking, figuring they stumbled out of the bar drunk. They reeked of hard liquor. Then suddenly, the two men started trying to pry my daughter off of me. They must have not realized she was in a carrier. I tased the man nearest to me and ran home like hell. Once inside, I locked everything. I peeked out of the blinds and no one had followed me home. I called the police. They came, filed a report, and did rounds around my house, just in case. They said I was lucky because human trafficking and sex trafficking is big in the area. I never heard anything back, so I assumed no one was ever caught. I always think back to that moment and shudder at what could have happened. So please, everyone be aware of your surroundings. Always carry something to defend yourself. You never know what kind of sickos are out there waiting and watching. Some years ago, I'd say 2014 to 2015, my sister and I were scouring all hiking trails in San Jose, and one afternoon, decided upon a small but semi-reputable sounding one. We parked after surviving a badly made one-way road, and started out with our dog at around 3.30. The trail markers weren't in great condition, but we still easily found a main path to a scenic overview. It was about a 20 to 30 minute hike, which curved gently around a giant rock and was relatively straightforward. We got to the overlook, admiring views of a dam and the town for a good minute before turning around to start back. We turned around and it was as if the straightforward trail we'd just been on had vanished and there was only one to the left going up and one to the right going down. At first we thought, Okay, this is weird, but let's just get back. We tried the path going up and around a hill, but it didn't seem right. 
At this point, I said, Well, the gate's closed in 45 minutes. We have time, if we could connect back with the trail we took. So, we went back to the one heading down, and somehow kept going further down the mountain, when it should have joined with the main path. We knew something was wrong when the direction wasn't changing and it was getting dark. So keep in mind that we parked at 3.30ish, got to the overlook at 4, and by 6 to 6.30 we were lost. Thank everything I'd brought my mobile charger, and there was a clear spot with reception halfway up the trail we were on, and at the top where it intersected. I had to call 911, who had to call the park service to get someone to pick us up. The listed park's emergency numbers were useless. Once we were rescued, it was a good 15 minute drive back to the lot. Had the main trot been that long, we never would have made it to the scenic overlook with the sun still up. A 20 to 30 minute walk on an obvious main trail, with plenty of light still, and we ended up needing a drive back that would have taken us two hours to walk. Not to mention my sister's dog who is typically very good with knowing where to go, was frightened and confused. We are convinced we got caught in a vortex or a time warp of some kind, because we can't explain how a fairly short walk put us hours away from the car. I am not a religious person, but I do believe that there are beings that exist outside of the physical. Although, I have been back and forth in my belief that there is a benevolent God. Every time that I've been in the grasps of an evil presence, I find that calling upon the Lord's name would always make that evil presence disappear. I haven't had very many supernatural experiences in my life. But when they do happen, I don't forget them. A few years ago, my family moved into a fairly new house. At the time I was in college, so I would only visit them during breaks. But during the summer of 2015, I stayed with them for about two and a half months. Since I didn't have a car and my mom was essentially always at work, my younger siblings and I were stuck in the house. I tried to make the best of it though, by finding a movie for us to watch almost every night. Most of them being horror. I'd say that everything was fine for the first few weeks that I was there, but then things started getting slightly weird. One night, while I was scrolling through social media, I heard my stepdad come back from work and shuffle around in the kitchen while he was on the phone. I walked downstairs to go greet him and he wasn't there. I stood in the living room, dumbfounded. I mean, where was he? I just heard him on the phone. A few minutes later, I heard the door unlocking, only to see my stepdad walking in. Were you in a few minutes ago? I asked. No, I just got in, he says. Did you walk in and out? He shakes his head no. I was so confused. My stepdad is an alcoholic and comes home either tipsy or drunk most nights, so I figured maybe he had a few drinks and just forgot that he was in the house. But looking back, he seemed pretty sober and coherent that night. Just a few days after that incident, it happened again. I heard what sounded like my mom and sister coming back from the grocery store. I could literally hear their voices. I went downstairs to help them out, and once again, they weren't there. I started to question whether I was becoming detached from reality or not. I've never heard voices before. I shared this with my sister, who expressed to me that she too was experiencing something similar. She said that there had been times where she thought she heard me or our younger brother talking only for us to not even be there. The thought that something was imitating my voice made me feel very uneasy. I've heard stories of people thinking they heard a family member or friend calling their name. 
Now, I've been told that in those instances, it's a demon who is looking for an invitation. But what exactly is the purpose of imitating a conversation? The weirdest moment I experienced in that house happened one night as I was falling asleep. I was in this half-asleep, half-awake state, kind of like an in-between, where I could feel myself drifting. Suddenly, I began to hear a man shouting in my ear. I don't remember what it said, but I woke up fully expecting to see a person in my room. But there was no one. After that night, I spent a few days looking up what could be the cause of this. I stumbled upon a Christian forum where I talked about this specific experience and was told that it was for sure a demon trying to mess with me. On the other hand, I found websites that described this event as a normal psychological occurrence. Although I do believe that many things can have scientific reasoning, I also believe that sometimes there are otherworldly things at play. The most notable incident happened the night before I was supposed to move out of my door. As I slept on my side, I felt like I was being pushed, like something was trying to roll me onto my stomach. But because I knew it wasn't an actual person, I didn't care and continued to sleep. The morning after, as my family was helping me pack up, I started to feel this burning sensation below my left shoulder. I asked my sister to take a look, and she told me there were three long scratch marks. I thought maybe I had scratched it myself while unconscious, but given that there were three marks, and I felt myself being pushed, I knew it was from something that didn't mean well. In a separate experience I had, I fell asleep on the couch, in my family's newest house only to find myself in that dreadful state of not being able to move. Some people say that sleep paralysis feels like someone is pushing you down. For me, it feels like a vibration all throughout my body, almost as if whatever it is is made up of some buzzing vibrational energy. I tried so hard to open my eyes, to speak, to move, until I finally found the strength to say, Jesus. Just as I said it, I could hear the ice from the dispenser in the kitchen drop loudly, and I was able to open my eyes. Instead of feeling afraid, something told me that the sound of ice falling symbolized that the spirit is being ripped out of the house. I have my theories as to why these things happen, but I am interested to hear from others as to what they think is the reason for these eerie events. I believe the stuff about the paranormal, as I've experienced either a ghost or spirit when I used to work at a fast food restaurant. Funnily enough, I went to grab some food or wine stock and was nearly attacked by a ghost. It was from then on that I believed. The UFO stories I would debunk, my thoughts or maybe it's an experiment run by secret agencies or someone flying a UFO drone as you could probably purchase these through the web. But I did not doubt that UFOs may exist. It was until one night on September 23rd, 2017, I had my dinner and drinks, including gaming with other players online. After I'd come back from a busy day, I had felt an aura and was tired. I decided to look out my upstairs bedroom window for some reason as you would see nice views of the city and lights. It was then I saw what looked like, what I can only describe to be a grey disc shape, with like a flaming ring of light around it, with windows. I saw this maybe a thousand feet or so across the other few houses, and it was moving closer. I was amazed, but scared at the same time. As it approached, I decided to run into my storeroom in fear I may be taken up by it. I really wish I had had a proper camera phone that time, or a video recorder. I would have filmed for people to see. Jokingly, I thought maybe it's the chariot, 
as to what is described about the 144,000 remnant, but I did not feel like laughing. I am certain it was a UFO. If it was not, why would I have seen such detail? Also, the fact it was moving closer to my house, a couple of neighbors and the couple of houses in the next street had said, Did you see that thing last night? Pretty sure it was a flying object or something else. And I told them how glad I was that they described it. I wasn't sure what I had seen. Whatever that flying disc was, if I witness this encounter again, I will be sure to capture it on film to be sure of what it was. Some years back, when I was a newly minted 21-year-old, in the height of my explorative phase in life, I began participating in sex work. Now, technically speaking, the services that I provided did not violate my local laws, but individuals who did the same type of work I did often dealt with the same dangers as escorts due to the personal nature of the tasks. As a result, we all pretty much required the same type of screening for potential clients, both for safety and to avoid the hassle of police interaction. Trust me, even when you know you will get to walk away, you don't want to spend your whole evening with a vice detective, hell-bent on classifying you as a criminal or trafficking victim, through an hours-long game of, well, I just have a few questions, because time is money, and even when it wasn't money, I had things to do like spending the evening partying at my favorite dive bars. I learned very quickly from talking with other women locally through support boards how to effectively screen for clients and how to be assertive for my own safety. I rarely saw anyone who didn't have references from other sex workers, and if I did, I required proof of identification. I was lucky to have roommates who knew about my work and supported it completely. I never accepted clients to my home for any reason. Someone always knew where I was and with who. I would not accept rides from clients. And no voucher ID meant no appointment. So, on a regular sort of day, I was sorting through the morning messages I had gotten. Regulars quickly separated from veteran hobbyists with vouchers. And then one message from someone who claimed to be new. As per usual, I informed him of the need to provide me with confirmation of his identity before scheduling could happen. He kept dodging this by asking me very explicit questions about specific services. This is a red flag, even for escorts. Usually, you're dealing with a cop who is fishing, or more commonly, a creep who wants to get off on free dirty talk and wasting your time. I politely but firmly informed him I don't provide any of those services and that I didn't engage in explicit conversation. If he had been perhaps more discreet, I might have offered to point him in the direction of some who did like to talk about such acts. However, I already didn't like his demeanor, which disqualified him from any sort of referral, because nobody wants clients like that. Reputation matters with the clients as much as the workers. At this rejection, he began sending me graphic messages about the violent things he wanted to do to me. He began to claim he would just message me under a different account to trick me into meeting him and that he would do what he wanted anyway. Now, that in of itself wasn't unusual. I had had flustered men lash out. There are blacklists for a reason. A lot of people don't realize that sex workers in a locality or even a whole state are in contacts through various means to scope out clients in the relatively tight-knit in-person sex work community. What struck me, though, is that this person proceeded to continue to text me the same threats from various accounts, until I explained there would never be a situation where someone doesn't know where I am, who I am meeting, and even if it did happen, I was malicious enough to ensure the police would be the last of their worries. And then the text stopped. I was a little weirded out by it, but it sort of came with the territory. I had the numbers to the blacklist resources, and let the other girls know, and so on. I figured, since the messages stopped, I was fine. 
he probably found something more interesting to do. About two weeks after the texts, one of my roommates was up early for class, and when I woke up in the afternoon, he told me that some weird guy had been up on our porch that morning looking lost. This itself also wouldn't be too weird, since we lived in a massive apartment complex near a large university. Think upwards of 40 buildings with a couple hundred units. People got the wrong apartment for themselves or their friends often. I once even drunkenly wandered into the right apartment in the wrong building once. We laughed about it, and my roommate described him in case he was a sketchy person casing apartments, which also sometimes happened. The skinny guy who was about 5 foot 8 with brown hair and patchy facial hair. There was no reason to suspect anything out of the ordinary until about a week later. It was evening and I had an appointment with a client. To avoid using my own car that clients could identify, I had taken to calling a cab. Very quickly, I ended up with the same driver, Jake, a few times. He caught on quick and really appreciated large tips I left. Jake and I quickly struck up a friendship and I had him in speed dial as well as knowledge of his work schedule so I could have him drive me every time. I like consistency. So Jake pulled into the parking lot and called to let me know he was there and asked to come in to use my bathroom, to which I obliged. This wasn't a safety concern as he worked for a registered taxi company with strict screening and I had his cab number memorized. Plus, he was a really stand-up guy. So Jake comes up, and I go to meet him on the porch. For context, the units had a full door you went through to get to a porch. Then the door to the apartment is accessible from the porch. Jake comes through the porch door, and I walk back through the front door so he can follow. Once I was inside, I heard the porch door open and a man's voice. I didn't hear what he said right away, but Jake turned to answer. I could see Jake still, but not the man. Sorry, what? You're here for who? Jake asked. I'm here to see Claire, the voice said. Jake's eyes narrowed. Claire was the name I used for clients, never friends. It isn't remotely close to my actual name. I could hear my heart rate go through the roof. I didn't know what to do. But luckily, Jake was a quick thinker and knew that nobody showing up to my place should be calling me by that name. Nah, man, you've got the wrong place. Nobody named Claire lives here. Jake shrugged sort of nonchalantly. The man muttered an apology and I heard the porch door open and close again. Jake came inside and I closed and locked the door behind him. We shared a what the actual fuck look for a moment. I asked him what the guy looked like. He said he was about the same height as himself, 5 foot 8 ish, with brown messy hair and messed up facial hair. He added that the guy was also scrawny. I told Jake I was pretty sure my roommate had seen the guy the week before. He reminded me to stay safe, use the bathroom, and then we left. At this point, I was freaked out over the next several days. There was no way the guy was just casing the place to break in or even had the wrong unit anymore. I wondered if the messages were connected. I couldn't prove it, and contacting the police was out of the question for my area. They're worse than useless if you have to explain you're being stalked because you're a sex worker. So I made sure my handgun was on the nightstand when I slept, and always on my person when I left home. I was thankful I'd gotten my concealed carry license the moment I was 21. It gave me enough peace of mind to return to life as usual for about a month. At about 5.30am, I was out on a porch chair having a cigarette after a long bender. The chair was tucked into an alcove sort of area that made it so I wouldn't have to be seen from the path up to the building and also shielded my eyes from the early morning brightness. Then the door opened. My serotonin depleted brain struggled to find out what the hell was happening. All of my roommates were with the family for a holiday weekend. My dumb dealer boyfriend had been MIA for a few days. Then I saw him. Average height, a slim sort of wiry build, brown hair, and a scraggly attempt at a beard. A chill ran down my spine instantly. He turned and saw me. 
sitting there alone. He actually looked shocked at the sight of me, though I could tell he recognized me. Luckily, my brain chemistry at that moment had kept my expression rather blank. Hey man, what are you doing? I asked. I didn't want to let on, I knew he'd been here before. Oh, sorry, I'm just looking for Lily. He sort of stammered the words out. My face forgot to use its inside expressions at that moment, and I looked at the sky like he had two heads. You see, there was indeed a lily in the apartment. However, I highly doubted she had any capacity to be making arrangements for visitors, seeing as she was my dog. The gun was in my room and not with me. The man continued, Yeah, I'm here to see Lily. Can I come in? I snapped out of my confused state at that point and started yelling as I shoved the man out the still open door back out to the breezeway. Fuck no, get off my porch and don't come back. If I see you again, the first call will be to the coroner. He seemed genuinely shocked. I was so irate, I'm honestly surprised I managed to stop before I backed him up to the stairs. I went back to my porch to put out my cigarette went inside and locked the door. Lily was going absolutely nuts having heard me yelling. She immediately stopped once I was inside. I laughed to myself, thinking I should have just let him meet Lily. I don't think he knew it was the dog's name, but maybe heard it at some point while creeping around. I felt a lot better afterwards. I had confronted the monster I was worried about, and won in a physical confrontation. I was still iffy about whether the messages were specifically connected or not, but I definitely knew he was aware of my work without having been an actual client. At this point, being young and invincible, I was sure that was the end of it. I went back to my partying, recreational drugs, work, and my crappy boyfriend Trey. Until about a month later. My boyfriend came into the apartment just a bit after I'd walked home from the bar across the street. He'd had a key and would let himself in whenever he actually felt like turning up. He threw a smashed phone on my bed. I asked him what that was about. He said he had seen the guy I described at the back entrance of my building on a bike when he turned up. Apparently, my boyfriend had baited him, asking if he knew which apartment Claire was in. The guy had smirked and gave him my apartment number, asking if he was about to go have a good time. That was all the confirmation Trey needed, that this was the creep I had been talking about hanging around. I had also said I wasn't sure if he sent the texts. Trey wouldn't tell me what he specifically did, aside from making the guy unlock his phone, revealing the initial text conversation in an app. Trey's hands were in his jacket pocket at this point and he excused himself to go wash his hands. Seeing as no body was reportedly found, and Trey was a jerk but not a killer, I'm speculating that the guy was taught much more physically this time that he wasn't welcome. It was probably brutal since Trey was a big guy. After that, I never saw the guy or got any weird messages from him again. I'm not sure how he found out where I lived, as I'm generally pretty good about privacy it's likely that he thought he was tougher than he really was when he made those threats, but thinking about seeing him in the flesh makes me laugh. I'm short, but I'm not a tiny lady. I had probably 50 pounds or more on him, and I definitely could have taken him. With that said, don't do drugs. Be safe and cautious if you're going to do sex work. Do not date drug dealers, and be safe. If you want a big-ass boyfriend, just find a farm boy from the Midwest. All the hand-throwing on your behalf without the raging addiction issues. In 2018, my boyfriend Jonathan and I moved into our first apartment together. 
We were so excited that we would have our own place and finally be adults. It didn't take long in our new apartment to spot the complex's resident weirdo. He lived in our building on the third floor. We were on the first. He was late 50s, early 60s and had a face that seemed to lack all emotion. He drove an incredibly rusty old truck and would go outside to feed the wildcats in the area every day. He seemed harmless, weird, but harmless. One day, Jonathan and I get back home after work, and he is outside. Standing beside his truck, his eyes are glued to us, and shivers run down my spine. Jonathan tells me that he doesn't want to get out of the car because he's freaked out. I don't want to let him know that I'm on edge too, so I reassure him that we're in the open. It's daylight, and nothing bad is going to happen. When we get out of the car, and I open the trunk to get my backpack, because I was planning on grading my students' vocabulary quizzes, and when I close the trunk and look up, the creepy old man is right in front of me. His eyes are wide, as if he just saw something that unnerved him. I jump and say, Oh, I'm sorry. You scared me. Is everything okay? No, he responds. That woman that just moved into the fourth floor is such a bitch, right? His voice reminds me of one I've heard before, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Well, sir, I haven't actually met her. Is there... She called the office about these cats, and now they're going to call animal control on them. Oh, wow. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I just figured you guys would feel the same way. This place is a hellhole, and they've gone to shit in the past year. He puts his hand up to his mouth, as if he's about to tell us a secret. I used to work for them, you know. I'd open and close up the pools, and clean up a bit around the property. They fired me a few months back, once they found out about my lifestyle. They don't get our lifestyle, he says moving his finger around to point at himself, Jonathan and I. I assume that he meant because we are gay men, but even now I'm not entirely sure. Damn, that's messed up, Jonathan says, trying to edge his way closer to the apartment door. Yeah, they're just all a bunch of bastards, and I hope the new woman hears that, he says. And at this point, I realized where I heard his voice before. The Nightmare on Elm Street films. He sounded just like Freddy Krueger. Jonathan says, Well, I hope it's not too bad. I start working there on Monday. Well, good luck. Try to keep your personal business quiet. Otherwise, you might be out of a job. Just don't turn into one of those assholes. Or karma may come back to get you, the old man said, chuckling to himself. Jonathan and I nervously laugh as well. Well, good luck with the cats. We'll see you around, I say, putting my hand on Jonathan's lower back and slightly pushing him towards our apartment. All right, guys, nice talking to you, he said, still chuckling to himself. Although, it was more creepy than joyous. It reminded me of the Joker from Batman, a maniacal laugh. A month passes and we see the old man occasionally. The cats were still there, so we figured things worked out for him. However, we haven't had another conversation with him, thankfully. Jonathan managed to keep his job at the office, where there was no trace of homophobia, and that's when he heard the news. Evicted? I asked Jonathan when he came home from work one day. Why are they evicting him? Well, my boss says that the office receives harassing calls from him on a weekly basis. Even some of the other tenants have reported being harassed by him. I mean, yeah, he's creepy, but is that enough to evict him? I guess so. They gave him a week to get all of his shit together and move. A week later, Jonathan was at the office, and the old man came in to return his keys. Jonathan was at the front desk, and had already phoned for the manager, but the old man started whispering things under his breath. Get out of here. 
They're bastards. All of them. Get out. The manager comes in, grabs the keys, and escorts the creepy old man out of the building. A week went by, and we hadn't seen any trace of the old man. Jonathan and I are watching TV around 12am one night, when I hear a knock at the door. I pause the show, thinking that it may be a neighbor complaining our TV is too loud. I look through our peephole to see the creepy old man staring at me through the peephole. A smile covers his face, but it's unnatural. I've never seen a smile so big in my life, and it makes my whole body run cold. I start to stumble back from the door. Jonathan sees that I'm pale with fear. Babe, what's wrong? He whispers. It's the old man, I whisper, tears welling up in my eyes. Jonathan gets off the couch and stands behind me. We're both facing the door. The man knocks again, and it startles me back to reality. I start walking to the kitchen, and I grab all the knives that I can. I tell Jonathan to go into the bathroom, which is the only room without a window, and call the police. I start to walk to the bathroom too, when I hear keys start jiggling against our door. I look back to find that the security bolt was not folded against the door. This works like a hotel security bolt when someone can use a key to open the deadbolt, but as long as the security bolt is across the door, it won't fully open. I silently make my way over to the door, knife in hand, and slowly and quietly fold the bolt across the door. As soon as it touches the door, the old man bangs into the door, making me jump back a bit, almost dropping the knife. Then it went quiet. No keys, no knocks, no bangs. And then I hear whispering, come on boys. Let me in. It's just me. Come on. It's karma. If I wasn't utterly freaked out before, I am now. I run to the bathroom and close the door quietly so he doesn't hear us moving around and know where we are. Jonathan has already gotten off the phone with the 911 operator and she said the police were on their way. Five minutes pass and it's still quiet. So Jonathan wants me to go check if the man is still there. I look through the peephole and don't see anything. I sigh with relief, but then I think to check the parking lot to see if his truck is there. I go to our guest room with a view of the parking lot and peer through the blinds. His truck is parked right next to my vehicle and I see that he's in the driver's seat of his truck. He's staring at me. Well, I can't be 100% sure, but it looks as if we've locked eyes. I don't want to move out of fear that I'd be giving myself away in the off chance that he actually wasn't looking at me. He opens his truck door, and that breaks me from my stupefied state. I run back to the bathroom and tell Jonathan to lock the door. I fill him in on the information. About three minutes pass before we hear banging on the door. Shit, I say under my breath. But then we hear, county police. I go and check the peephole. It is an officer. So I open it and tell him what's going on. The officer said he saw the truck outside, but no one was in it. He said he was going to take a look around the apartment and see what he could find. Jonathan and I continue to camp out in the bathroom. All of the lights in our apartment are now off. We wait to hear from the officer, but within 10 minutes, we start to hear crazed screaming, almost demonic noises, hisses, coughs, screams, laughs, that kind of thing. My heart drops, and I'm overcome with more fear than before. What is going on? Five minutes later, the police officer came to our door, and he said he found the man in the vacant apartment directly above ours. When the officer got there, the man was standing, facing a corner and laughing under his breath. When the officer put the handcuffs on him, he began thrashing about, screaming and hissing. The officer told us that he had him in the cruiser and that they arrested him on breaking and entering charges. When the police officer left, 
we checked the front of our door, where there were now dents from the man's keys. He struck our door with them after being unable to get in. The next day, we went upstairs with the manager of the apartment complex, and we saw a small hole in the floor of the bathroom in that apartment. Apparently, the man must have known that we were hiding in our bathroom, and he was trying to get in from the ceiling above us. Luckily, he didn't have any heavy-duty tools to do the trick. This hole was made by a screwdriver being stabbed into the linoleum floor over and over again. This story takes place in northern Italy, back in 2014. It was early September. A friend of mine invited me to take a short hike in the woods near his town, and I obviously agreed, since I love hiking in the nature. We prepared our backpacks, grabbed some food, and drove to the place. My friend knew the area very well, so we didn't take a map. We didn't have flashlights either, since we planned to return to the car in a few hours. And in early September, daylight lasts until late. As we got deeper into the woods, we saw beautiful spots, small rivers, and a pair of caves we explored. They were pretty small and only had one big chamber. We had lunch and proceeded to follow a trail through a deeply wooded area. After around an hour and a half, we arrived at a pretty large clearing. In that clearing were a bunch of around four to five people normally dressed. They were simply talking and laughing. No cults, dreadful chants, praying in a circle or the like. Just super ordinary people like my friend and I, talking to each other. They obviously saw us too, since the clearing had no trees or rocks to cover the view, and we couldn't avoid that. Since the trail, after a deep curve, they immediately ran through the clearing, over to the other side of it. We said, approaching them, Hey there, what's up? They didn't answer back, and started to stare at us, without saying a single word. We stopped too, and I looked to my friend. He looked back at me, concerned too. We said again, Hey, no answer. I started to feel uneasy, so we decided to return back to the car. But soon after we retreated, we realized that they started to follow us. As we noticed it, we yelled, Why are you following us? Did we do something wrong? No answer. Yeah, we were still pretty young and dumb. In those kinds of situations, you should run immediately out of there if people act this way. We proceeded to walk faster and try to get off the trail. Another pretty dumb choice, but again, my friend knew the area well. But they kept close at a constant distance of around 15 meters. We started to panic, so we looked again at each other and agreed to get out of there quickly. As soon as we began running, we heard them start to run too. This freaked us out. We did our best to put more distance between them and us. Another thing that made me panic was the fact that we were around 40 minutes away from the car at that point, in a very isolated area so I thought that we were beyond hope. At a certain point, when we were about halfway back, we started to notice that they weren't behind us anymore. We thought that maybe we managed to lose them. We hid behind a thick bush and tried to listen. Silence. No footsteps, nor voices. So we took our breath and managed to return to the car, trying our best to be as silent as possible. We jumped in the car and sped out of there, but it doesn't end there. As we left the woods on the main road, we saw another car behind us, coming from a secondary road. They were following us again, and it became clear that they had tabs on us the whole time. We were sure that they were the same people, since number one, they were basically tailgating us. Number two, this area is very rarely visited and there were absolutely no cars except for my friends. And number three, their car had no plates. We drove to my friend's town, 
taking every country road and every turn we made, they did as well. We tried to not lead them back to my friend's house. As we reached the town's border, they made a U-turn and returned back in the direction of the woods. We were terrified and we immediately called the police and informed the people that were in the small town square as they approached us. We told them to check the area out, but no evidence of activity was found. We did not see them again, but we became paranoid for some weeks to even leave our houses. And this is why I've taken a break for hiking for about four years. I have no idea who they were and why they acted like this. It's been terrifying, and this happened in broad daylight. Eerie. Okay, so last year around this time, it all began. Last year on a Saturday night, shortly after 1am, I heard someone creep up my staircase. I live in a two-story home on the second floor. I heard the crackling of the wood steps. I paused my TV show. I listened, and I heard it some more. Then I hear a long pause. Nothing. Then I hear my doorknob jiggle. I freak out. I know it's not the woman downstairs, because she's gone for the night. I went straight to the door. I have one of those doors where it's half glass window, because I live in a tiny town, and my upstairs staircase is covered, so technically, no one can see you inside unless they're standing right at the door, and even at that, all they can see is part of my doorway into the bedroom in my hallway, nothing more. So I had the light on at the door inside, the outside light was off, so when I went to the door, I couldn't see out of it. I couldn't see who was there. When I showed myself at the door, obviously the doorknob stopped jiggling, because I made my presence known, and they could obviously fully see me, because my lights were on. I shut off the inside lights real quick, as an attempt to see who was out there, but it took my eyes too long to adjust. And as I shut off the lights, I simultaneously hit the second lock on my door, and that's when the person on the other side of the door started banging on it. I couldn't see who it was, and quite honestly, once the banging began, I bolted. And so did they. So I tried to look out my window and catch a glimpse of who it was, but I couldn't see anything. The exit of the staircase is too close to the house for me to have a full view of from the second floor, which is a shame. So I called the cops and I filed a report, and all was good in the world. I equipped my home with wasp spray hidden in every corner. I did develop major anxiety over it though, like major anxiety. I have never been afraid to live alone before this, but I've worked through it for the most part, and have gotten better since this was last year. I even got a camera that I have at my front door that streams to an app on my phone. In the last couple of months, I have been having issues though. I park in the small lot across the street. The lot belongs to a church I live next to, however, I am allowed to park there. I keep finding the sides of my license plate completely bent outwards at a 90 degree angle every morning. I know because I put them back in place every day, so the plates are flat because you can't drive around with your plates like that and pretty much every day of the week, I go outside to find my plate spent back. I know it's not the wind, and I know it doesn't happen when I'm driving, because I check. My dad, however, has convinced me that it could be the car wash. I get my car washed at least once a week or two, and it's the kind where you just have to pay a machine and sit in your car. So I brushed it off. But then I recently came home to find three things on a small shelf I keep outside my door. Two small crystal bowls and a little flower pot with a golden retriever on it. At first I thought, oh, my sister or grandma probably just left it for me. I messaged them about it, and they both said, no, they didn't leave anything. 
They both live on my block, so I thought it would be probable for them to just do that, but both of them denied even doing it. Then my next thought would be that it's my mom. See, anytime my mom gets me stuff, she leaves it in her front sunroom, which she calls her porch, so she will always text me a picture of what she got me and say, it's here on the porch, get it when you stop by next. In a year and a half I've lived in this apartment, she has never left something on my porch. Also, my camera was dead. So I texted her about it, and she didn't answer, which is like her. If it doesn't pertain to her, she doesn't answer. Also, I'm slightly confused about the golden retriever planter, because everyone knows I'm a cat person, and that's what everyone who knows me gets me. So tonight, at 1.19am, I was in my bedroom texting my sister when I heard banging on my door again. The lady who lives downstairs is gone for the night again. This exact same thing happened a year ago too. A Saturday night, right after 1am, all the lights in my apartment were on, so they knew I was home. If they wanted to break in, they could have. If they wanted my valuables, they have 60 hours out of the week, every week this last year, to do so. No, whoever is messing with me just wants to mess with me. I didn't know what to do. My phone was on the other side of the apartment, and I couldn't get to it without going past the door. So I told my sister through text message on my laptop, and she called the cops for me. They arrived, and I knew because I saw them searching the property with their flashlights, and I met them at the door. I filed a report and noped out of there. I am now sleeping at my sister's house for the night, but this is seriously freaking me out. Someone is messing with me in a very serious way. They know I'm home. They know I'm up. They know the woman who lives downstairs is gone. They know the camera isn't charged. Coincidentally, these things keep happening when my camera isn't charged. It takes hours to do and I'm so paranoid of leaving something charged while I'm asleep or not at home. I don't have any enemies in this area. I don't really know anyone in this town except for a co-worker or two and my landlord and family. I don't have any ex-boyfriends trying to scare me. I haven't fought with anyone who's trying to get revenge on me. As a quick setting, this takes place in La Pataca, which is a rural little area just south of Monterrey in Mexico. When I was a little girl, we always had legends of the witches in the wild. Don't go out alone. Don't stay out so late at night. If you do, Las Brujas will come and take you away. My mama would tell Armando and I these things every day. Mama would not let me or Armando go anywhere unless it was the both of us, and the furthest we could go was the small store a mile away when we had to get groceries. We were not well off with money, so we had to walk everywhere. When Armando and I got done working on the fields, Mama would let us play until it was night time. Sometimes we would play tag with our friends, sometimes Papa would chase us around, or take us exploring in the woods around. The exploring was fun, because we got to see animals, but we also saw the little old huts where Las Brujas lived in. Everyone called them Las Brujas because they were weird and would constantly try to do black magic and talk to themselves. One day, Armando and I were playing alone because Papa was tired from working on the field all day and Mama had to make supper. We went to the woods and started to explore, but we went too deep and got lost. I cried and cried because I wanted mama, but nobody heard us so we kept walking around. After a little bit, an old lady heard us and she said she would help us. No, you are a bruja and you're gonna take us away, yelled Armando. No, no, mijo, I know where your mommy and papi are, she said. I cried more and told Armando that I wanted to go home, so he gave up and told the lady to help us. 
Okay, follow me. After a while, she took us to a house we didn't know, but said Mama and Papa were inside. Without thinking, we went in and the lady suddenly grabs us and carries us screaming to another room. She threw us in and locked the door. Armando kept banging on it and yelling to let us go, and I just cried and cried. It was quiet, but I thought I heard her keep saying, Glory to God for giving me the blood of these two innocents, which I can use for revenge on those that did me wrong before. Amen. I do not remember exactly how much time passed, but I remember lying on the ground because I was tired after crying for so long. According to Papa, we were not home so he went around town looking for us, until he came into the woods to look. He said he stopped at the house we were at because something, maybe God, told me to look here. When Papa called out to the house inside, the Bruja kept yelling at him to go away, but he said he thought he heard Armando, so he broke inside and looked around. He found us and said he heard banging which showed him where we were. When he found us, he hugged us and took us away, telling the Bruja that if he ever saw her near our house with the kids again, he would kill her. Mama was crying so hard when we saw her that it made me cry again too. Papa yelled at us for being dumb and going so far out, and Armando just looked at the floor. After that, Mama didn't let us go out anymore without her or Papa until we were teenagers. Every day I thank God for not letting Armando and I get into more danger that day. I do not know what the Bruja wanted to do with us, but I don't want to know either. This story takes place in Northeast Oklahoma, I believe around 2009 to 2010. I was around 14 years old at the time, so back then, my aunt and I did everything together. She was my best friend, my rock, my everything really. Our favorite thing to do in our boring and rural town was to just go driving around. I believe I had just finished school for the summer, it was May and she offered to take me on a celebratory drive around town. In my hometown, there's an old mental hospital that's been closed since the 1990s. It's located in a more rural-ish area. I've always been fascinated by it, and she was too. There's a prison located extremely close to it with guards in white trucks, frequently driving the roads and preventing people from trying to sneak into the abandoned mental hospital. We both decided on driving around this abandoned mental hospital. It's just too cool and creepy. There's a cemetery where they mass buried many of the patients. Just beyond the hospital and doctor's houses, past the cemetery, everything gets rural. You are far from the town by this point, and there's only this single lane, lone, winding road. We're driving, having fun, just talking about anything and everything. It's late afternoon by this point, Roughly around 4.30. It's just like any old drive that we've been on so many times. That's when I looked in the rearview mirror and saw a white Jeep Cherokee behind us. It had seemingly come out of nowhere. We both shrugged it off. We thought it must be a prison guard or something. It became unnerving the longer we drove. He never turned off onto a side road. He just kept following us. I remember my aunt playing it so calm, but I knew she was fully freaking out. She just kept asking, is he still following us? There were times when I didn't see him, and I'd say, no, I don't see him. Then in the next minute, there he was right behind us. He got close enough at one point I could see his face. He was wearing what looked like Carrera sunglasses, very big and bulky. He was middle-aged. I'd assume white with a hat, and his dashboard was covered with junk. We kept driving further on this road through the middle of nowhere. There were several times we'd lose him and we would feel so relieved. 
At one point, we came to a railroad crossing on a hill. After we passed it, I didn't see him. We were so happy, and then there he was. He followed us for what felt like hours. If we sped up, so did he. I still get chills at the memory of looking in the rearview mirror and seeing his face. We were also in such a rural area that we could not get cell phone signal. Finally, we emerged onto a highway. We had no idea where, but we were just so elated to get to our main road. We turned onto it and my aunt sped off. I remember we got back to my mom's house and we were full of fear and adrenaline. We frantically said we were out driving and this guy started following us. My aunt confessed how scared she was. We never told the police or anything, and my mom always thought we were making a big deal out of nothing. But it was terrifying to be out in the middle of nowhere, no cell phone signal, and a strange car following you for a long time. I remember we talked afterwards about it. What if she had run out of gas, or her car broke down? What would he have done? For a little bit of background, I am in a wonderful relationship now with a guy I met on Tinder, so this is in no way, shape or form, me shitting on the app. I'm currently a senior at a four year university, but this happened in my sophomore year when I was 19. For me, it was pretty hard to find someone to just casually date and get to know, since I'm a bit of an introverted individual and wasn't looking for any old hump and dump. I also went through my fair share of abusive relationships, so dating for me was really difficult when it came to opening up and trusting people. When I matched with Chris, I was pleasantly surprised. He was a funny, smart, interesting college student with a decent job and good intentions. I enjoyed talking to him, but there was always a lot of anxiety when I spoke to him. I know now that I should have trusted my good instinct. But at the time, I assumed I was doing my introverted trust issues bullshit and try to push that feeling away. We would talk a few times a week, and every time we did, the feeling would persist. Only each time we talked, it would be stronger. He started to make comments about how he wanted me to be his girlfriend, and how he was so excited for me to meet his parents. But we hadn't met and only talked on and off for a few weeks at this point. So slowly, I stopped responding to some of his messages. Then I started to leave them completely unanswered. One day, I confided in my friends and told them about the bad feeling I always had while talking to Chris. They told me I wasn't being open to new experiences because I hadn't let go of my past and that I wasn't being fair to him. So, reluctantly, after a few weeks of radio silence and feeling guilty, I messaged him again. Another week or two of messaging and catching up, he asked me to go out to dinner with him. I was hesitant to say yes, as my anxiety was through the roof, but my friends insisted that it was just nerves, and it would be good for me to go out with someone. I agreed, and he excitedly told me he had plans to take me to a nice Japanese restaurant in the city next to my campus. My friends were ecstatic and asked to see a picture of him. I pulled up his Tinder profile, and when they swiped through the pictures, they were silent. You know, he, uh, he kind of looks like Benjamin. Benjamin was the name of my particularly abusive ex. I went into a full-blown panic attack. Once I saw the resemblance, there was no going back. There was no way I was going anywhere with this guy. I messaged him back the night before the date and explained that I no longer felt comfortable with going out and that I was sorry. He never messaged me back. That same week, I started getting multiple phone calls every day from an unknown number. They would leave me voicemails that would say things like, Call me back, babe. Baby, where are you? Why won't you give me a chance? I tried ignoring them, but one day, 
After getting almost 10 calls, I answered, ready to curse someone the fuck out. I called Chris by his name and told him to fuck off. I was met with laughter. This isn't Chris, this is Jeff. Who the? Chris said I could have you. He started laughing, so I hung up, and he immediately called back. I sent him to voicemail. He said you wanted to go out with me instead. He told me what university you go to, and showed me your pictures. I'll wait on campus if I have to. I blocked his number, and for a few more days I got a few more unknown calls and voicemails, detailing some pretty weird, aggressive, and gross shit but they eventually died down. I don't know if this guy was serious, or maybe it was Chris getting his friend to mess with me as revenge for cancelling, but whatever it was, it had me looking behind me any time I walked anywhere on campus for the rest of the semester. My roommates and I had a male stay with us for a while, just in case. I started going back to my hometown on the weekends, because I was afraid to stay on campus for too long. It's been two years, so I hope that, in this amount of time, Chris and Jeff have learned to become better people, or that someone kicked their asses already. My dad grew up in a safe, quiet, Virginian suburban neighborhood with two older brothers and three younger sisters. Him and his siblings would always walk to the bus stop and go to school together. They had some neighborhood friends that they would also meet up with. One kid that stood out of the bunch was named Monty. Monty was not really much of a friend, but more of a bully. No one really liked him because he was so mean and always picking fights. One day, him and my dad got into a physical altercation, and one of my dad's brothers had to separate them. Though the years, Monty was always around, but my dad and the other kids in the neighborhood always sensed that there was something off about him. My dad recollected often seeing him with bruises and scratches, and not knowing where they came from. As they got older, he stopped coming out to play, and he eventually dropped out of high school. My dad was a bit relieved that the neighborhood bully seemed to be gone. A few weeks later, my dad found out that Monty had not dropped out of high school, but in fact was arrested. He was sent to an institution for assault, robbery, and car theft. He was 14 years old at the time. He eventually convinced his counselors that he was improving and was able to be released from the mental institution. Once he was out, he went on to assault and murder five women. He was caught and sentenced to five life terms. My dad told me this story while he was showing me Monty's yearbook photo from high school. I believe that his mysterious bruises and scratches either came from abuse with his family or possibly even from his victims fighting back. You think about people you grew up with and the bullies in school as just being mean people who usually grow up and realize the error in their ways. You would never expect the bully in school to end up being the serial killer next door. About 20 years ago, my best friend at the time and his wife had her father, Felix, living with them. They were his caretakers. They pretty much did everything for him, and that included cleaning him every morning because of his incontinence. They really did a great job and deserved my compliments several times. One day, my friend Mike went into Felix's room when he would normally be awakening, only to find him in full rigor mortis. Felix had sadly passed away sometime in the night. I was employed at the time as a cemetery pre-need salesman, but also could arrange at-need services. And so I did. I helped them to prepare Felix's final resting location and waived my commission 
as I didn't feel right charging it to these two individuals who had done so much to make Felix's last years comfortable. About a week later, we held the service, at which I officiated, and it was well attended and we gave Felix the send-off he deserved. I rode home in the limo provided for family by the funeral home after the service, and we all sat around for a while. The wife, Mary, then noticed that there was a message on their answering machine. She pressed the play button, and the timestamp the machine read was oddly the identical time as when we had the graveside service for Felix. It was recorded at 11 a.m. The graveside service was also at 11 a.m. We thought at first it was just someone who had missed the service, calling to wish condolences. When the recording started, every jaw in the room suddenly dropped, and an honest-to-goodness chill filled the room. There were five of us present, Mike, Mary, myself, my brother James, and a friend of theirs from across the street. The background noise was the first thing we heard, and it sounded like someone was in a room with a large group of people. You know, lots of audible voices, but nothing that was completely discernible. Then Felix spoke. The voice on the recording was clearly and unmistakably Felix. Please do not follow me, was what he said. And then the recording stopped. We had what seemed like a recently deceased parent calling during his own funeral service, begging us to not follow him. Don't follow him into death. Not possible. Don't follow his life choices. He had made many bad ones, including a brief stint in prison for a relatively minor offense. Here's the one that his daughter thought was his intent. Don't follow me to hell. She had believed until her dying day that her father made contact one last time, telling her not to follow his path and end up where he did, once he took that step into the unknown journey called death. Twenty years later, and I remember that moment, and the stunned silence, shock, and fear of that moment like it just happened today. To this day, I am 100% certain that this phone call was indeed contact from Felix in the afterlife. This happened to me a little while ago, and I'm still freaked out about it. So I left my phone lying around and was trying to find it. I picked up my house phone and dialed my cell. I'm walking around with a home phone held away from my ear, looking for my cell phone. Suddenly, I hear the sound of a male voice, slightly high, answer and say, Hello? I was stunned. And after five seconds or so of silence, I hung up. I wait a few minutes in disbelief. Then I call my phone again. I still don't find it, but I don't hear the voice answer again. I found my phone charging where I'd left it. I open my cell phone and look at the missed calls. I only find the second call in the history. However, when I looked in the house phone's history, it shows that I dialed my cell phone twice. This was honestly the weirdest thing that has ever happened to me in my 25 years of life. So about a week after my great-grandmother passed, I was over visiting my grandparents, and we were all sitting around talking as usual, with nothing out of the ordinary, when suddenly their landline phone rings, and the number on the caller ID shows no name, but it only showed nine zeros. My granddad does this weird joke, where he gets a weird call from someone he doesn't recognize, and says, I don't know anyone with that name, and then he lets the answering machine get it. So a minute later, it shows that the ominous number left a message on the answering machine, 
and we play it. As the message plays, there's about 10 seconds of static noise, like someone has bad connection, and then it stops and we hear a woman's voice say, I love you. We all immediately turned and looked at each other and didn't say a word. A few more seconds of static, followed by those words, and then the message ends. We all recognize the voice is belonging to my great-grandmother. What adds to my belief that it was her is that she had this weird thing where she never said the words I love you to anyone. She was a sweet lady, but something about those words she would just never say, even if you said them to her. So I believe she regretted that and needed to pass that message along to my granddad. Nothing else happened since, but I will always remember that experience. I'm known for being a very smiley, bubbly, and social girl. Here is my experience. At the time this happened, I was the only person who did to-go orders, answered all the phones and customer questions, as well as greeting and cashing out to-go or delivery orders. It was mid-December, and where I live, we have a massive Christmas festival and tree lighting, so at the time, I was getting multiple phone calls, asking if we'd be open, or if we have any specials, that kind of thing. I answered the phone, and a typical script was said, blah blah blah. He was nice, but after I answered his questions about our restaurant, he started asking questions about me, my age, how long I worked there, if I was from where the restaurant was located. I felt weird, but I made an excuse that if he didn't have any more questions about the restaurant, that I needed to go. He told me I sounded beautiful, and he couldn't wait to meet me. It bothered me a bit, but I soon forgot about it. Jump forward a few weeks. The festival is here and we're busy. I'm helping in all aspects of the restaurant, and our bartender comes and grabs me and tells me a man at her table wanted to speak with me. Me thinking it was a complaint, I tell her okay, and I put on my best customer service smile, and then I go over. Hi everyone, I hope everything's okay over here but I heard from my wonderful bartender one of you wanted to speak with me. And this man staring at me says, My God, you're as beautiful as I dreamed you'd be. It's me, the guy you spoke to a few weeks ago. You were so amazing, and I just loved you since then. I was visibly freaked out, and I said, Oh, thank you. Is there anything else the matter? John replied, No. I just had to see what my new wife looked like. I said to him, Oh well, I've gotta go. You all have a great night. I walk away a little nervous, but soon get distracted. The bartender comes over and tells me John wants to say goodbye. So I give him a smile and a wave. That was not good enough. He comes to me arms open and wants a hug. I awkwardly smile and try to give a distant side hug. Not good enough. He grabs my shoulder, causing me to face forward, and gives me a really tight and hard hug. The night's over, and I ignore my uneasy feelings. I end up becoming sick for a couple of days. I come back, and my manager comes to speak to me, and he tells me that John has called the restaurant about 56 times, and would only want to speak with me. As we're discussing this, the bartender tells me someone wants to speak with me on the phone. I go behind the bar and answer, guess who? It's John, telling me he loved seeing me and couldn't wait for us to get married. I hang up. My manager and I decided to block the number. I finish my shift and start walking to my car. I notice a car parked weirdly in the parking lot. I giggle and ignore it. The car began to pull up and said something out the window that I wasn't paying attention to. I didn't hear them. I get into my car and start replying to texts. I notice the same car is now parked beside me, 
The window is cracked, so I can see that they are facing me, but I can't tell much else. The car then pulls up to the other side of my car, staring at me from each side for about five minutes or so. I notice it's John, and I was so scared. I was too scared to drive off, thinking he would follow me. The only thing I could do is call my job. Four guys come sprinting out the back with knives, and the car drives off. Unfortunately, we don't have cameras in our parking lot. My colleagues calm me down, and I drive home watching everything around me. That night, my phone started acting extremely weird, shutting on and off, out of control, as my apps are opening even though I haven't touched them. This has never happened before. I decide to shut my phone off, completely knowing I had another option of calling someone if need be. I wake up the next morning feeling nervous. I get ready for work and head out to my car. As I'm pulling away, I notice something on the side of my house. I go up to see, and it's two pocket knives. One appeared to have blood on it. The other was above my head. I took a step back, and that's when I noticed the second knife was stabbed into a picture. I notice it's a picture of me at a store shopping. At that moment I was done and I called the police. They take my statement and do the whole process you have to go through when reporting something like this. To make this long story a bit shorter, two other scary things that happened were pictures taken of me at random times and areas, were thrown all over my deck, and a note left on my car at work that said, Hi pretty, love you. The paper looked like it was soaked in blood. So now the number is blocked. Everyone in my restaurant knows what this guy looks like. I get walked in and out of my job by a male manager or co-worker. I have cameras everywhere and weapons. I hate having to do this, but it's for my protection. Nothing has happened for a little while. I just figured others would find this interesting. Or maybe it's happening to someone else and it makes them feel less alone. My mom had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and was a lung cancer survivor. She got sick last January and at the beginning of February she was sent home on hospice. My sister and I took care of her around the clock for about three weeks and she passed away with both of us there on February 21st, 2020. We had her cremated per her wishes. Sunday was her birthday, April 25th. On Monday, my sister was at home and she got a voicemail, but there was no missed calls. She listened to it, and it was my mother. She said, Natalie, it's mom. I've taken a turn for the worse, and they're sending me back to Charleston. Call me when you can. Love you. Obviously, my sister was shaken. She didn't tell me about it until a short while after. She didn't recognize the voicemail as something that had been left while my mom was alive, and our carrier deletes voicemails after a time, unless you actively save them. My sister did say it was her sick voice, not her healthy one. I can't stop thinking about it, but I can't figure it out either. My mom's line is on my plan but I haven't turned her phone on since she died. It doesn't cost me any more a month, so I never disconnected it. It was the night of Easter, and my family went to the usual bonfire. I was 10, and it got pretty late when my family decided to go home. It must have been around 2am, very late for 10 year old me. At the time, my mom still liked to cuddle with me and my brother before going to bed, so she did. 
when suddenly the phone rang. My mom picked up the phone, listened for about 5 to 10 seconds, and then hung up. She said she would be right back, and I waited. She got my father to lock every door and make sure the windows were shut, and he should come to the bedroom when he's done. She took me and my brother with her into the bedroom. She told us not to worry, but when my father came back, she quietly told him what happened. She was probably thinking I couldn't hear her or understand. She told him a man with a dark voice called, saying he's in our shelter, waiting for my dad to come out. He insisted that he knew my father, but the voice was not familiar at all and none of his friends had any reason not to just say their name or intention on the phone. My father seemed very worried. He once again left the bedroom to make sure he had locked every possible entrance, as well as the secret door to our basement, behind our fridge. When he came back, we all slept together in the same bed, but until I fell asleep, I noticed that my father wasn't really sleeping. Today, I'm pretty sure that it was a drunk guy who somehow managed to get a hold of our phone number or a prank call. At least, I hope that. This happened around 8 or 9 years ago. I was in a mall with my daughter as a weekend treat. I decided to go to a local cake store to sample a slice of their chocolate mousse. A few minutes later, after getting seated, my phone rang. It was my sister calling. She was at work at the time and was not allowed phones in the production area, so I was really concerned it may be important. When I picked up and said hello, a really creepy, really oily voice I did not recognize said, Oh, so you're just eating cake, are you? I think it may have said a few other things. I asked the name and why they were calling. The voice just laughed and laughed. <laughs> All I know is it was really, really wrong. I looked around and I remember thinking, that I was probably a victim of one of those gag shows. But then again, why go through all the effort of using my sister's name and number just for a prank call? I hung up and looked at my daughter. She was still eating cake. The people around us were minding their own business. The world stayed the same. I told my sister after, and she had no idea what I was talking about. There was no call lock on her phone that showed she dialed me. So, what happened? So I've been hit on by male telemarketers a lot. Every single time it leaves me shaking because they're so aggressive and creepy, but this one was by far the worst. I had to call Amazon customer service my freshman year of college about something that had been charged or returned by mistake, and I was chatting with the man helping me. I figure these people have to deal with grumpy assholes all day long. It's not going to kill me to be nice and make small talk for a bit, even though I'm horribly shy. It started with the normal questions in these chats. Where do you go to school? What are you studying? Do you like it? What's the state like? That kind of thing. This time though, the questions started getting more personal. How old are you? Do you live alone? Do you live alone at school? Do you have a boyfriend? And so on. Keep in mind, I'm only about 17, maybe just barely 18. At this point the transaction was over and this man was just talking to me. I wanted to hang up but I didn't want to be rude and honestly I was panicking a little. I don't remember what of the questions he asked but I remember they made me feel nervous and he'd also started calling me honey. Eventually I told him that the conversation needed to end 
and that I was uncomfortable. I wished him a good day and then hung up. I figured that would be the end of it and went to go hang out with my parents to calm down. About a week later, I get a call from someone asking for someone by name. I couldn't quite catch it. I said, my name is Chrissy. There is no one here by that name. I think you have the wrong number. The person replies that they have the right number and says that they need Olivia. This goes on for several minutes with the person on the phone getting more aggressive before he finally says, Oh no, honey. I know I have the right number. When I tell you my blood went cold, I mean ice in my veins, fight or flight activated, might faint cold. The second the person on the phone called me honey, something clicked, and I knew for a fact it was that same guy. I told him never to call me again and hung up immediately, but I was ready to cry. If this guy had the guts to call me on his own, just to be a creep, I didn't know what else he'd be willing to do. He had access to my Amazon account and could see my address, my phone number, my email, everything. I continued to receive calls for about a month where the person on the other end wouldn't say anything. But you knew for certain someone was there. I could hear them breathing. For some reason, like an absolute dumbass, I didn't tell a soul until this past semester. I've only told two people. I know I should have reported him the second it happened. They record calls, but I didn't know his name and I was terrified he would find me and retaliate. This happened not too long ago, and before anyone says anything, yes, I know I'm stupid. I had just gotten home from work around 9pm and had barely any time to get my shoes off when I get a phone call from some number I don't recognize. I'm searching for new jobs and I thought that it might be one of the places that I was applying to calling me back. I pick it up and it's some guy who says he's with some kind of third party detention center which, as he explained it, was for low-risk inmates that were sent there whenever the local jails were busy or filled. That should have set off a nice big red flag for me, but for whatever reason, it just made sense in my tired brain. I'm getting ready to tell this guy I'm not interested in making a donation or anything like that when he asks, This is Bethany Merriam Scott. I confirm, and he says that they're holding my boyfriend at this center saying my boyfriend's full name and giving a dead-on description of him. I ask what's going on since my boyfriend is supposed to be at work right now and the guy on the other end provides an explanation. Your boyfriend struck a pregnant woman with his car on his way to work and four times the label limit for blood alcohol. The woman is in critical condition. Your boyfriend sustained some injuries in the accident, some broken ribs and a broken nose. I'm freaking out at this point, and I ask if I can speak to my boyfriend, which the man obliges. I'm put on hold for a minute or two before my boyfriend picks up the line. The person on the other end was panicking, saying how it wasn't his fault and begged me not to tell his parents. Again, using my name. It didn't particularly sound like my boyfriend but I figured it was because of the broken nose he supposedly had, and his tone really helped to sell it, because it all sounded so legitimate. The man from before comes back on the line, and before I can ask any questions, he explains that they had to sedate my boyfriend, since he had begun to panic and hyperventilate, which I was starting to relate to more and more by the second. The man on the other end tells me that I should come right away, and that the bail is set up at $2,000, cash only. I stupidly tell him that I don't have that much, and that I maybe have half of that. He tells me that it's fine, and I can work something out with the front office once I get there, and to just bring what I have. 
and all while seemingly like he's trying to calm me down. He's given me the address and I can barely hold a pen because my hands are shaking so badly and I'm very poorly trying to hold back tears. All of a sudden, the doors open up and in walks my boyfriend, completely normal looking with no broken nose but more than a little confused as to why I'm crying. I'm still on the phone with the man and ask him what the fuck he thinks he's doing, telling him that my boyfriend just walked in, to which he promptly hangs up. I tried calling back a few times, but it went directly to voicemail. I find out that the power to the bar my boyfriend works at had gone out, so his boss sent everyone home early and I had never been so grateful for a power outage. My boyfriend slept on the couch to keep watch, but unfortunately, I couldn't sleep that night. So I decided to look up the name of the organization the man said he worked for. Big surprise that turned up nothing. I then looked up the address he had given me on Google Maps and see that it was a random abandoned strip mall in the middle of a sketchy ass area that was about an hour and a half out of town. What really freaked me out about this whole thing was the guy knew my number, both me and my boyfriend's names, but didn't sound like anyone we had met before. I have no idea what would have been waiting for me there, but I'm counting my lucky stars right now. So here's a bit of background. I work at the front desk of a hotel. I'm an anxious mess. I'm also overly nice. My anxiety makes it so I shy away from confrontation at all costs, which usually makes me so passive that I'll just go along with anything, even if I'm uncomfortable. At the desk, we're used to guys hitting on us, asking us what time we leave work and if we want to skinny dip with them in our pool. Well, it's a rare occasion, but sometimes we also get weird phone calls. I've had my fair share, but one in particular stood out. The conversation went something like this. Thank you for calling Lakeview Hotel. This is Ayana. How can I help you? Oh, that's a pretty name. I'm sure your boyfriend hates it. I I'm sorry? I'm sure it gets a lot of conversation from the guy. I mean, not really. A beautiful name for a beautiful girl, right? I mean, I, I guess. So how'd you get that name? I, I don't know. My dad liked it. Oh, is he Native American? No. Is your mom? No. That's crazy. So you're not Native American. Is your hair blonde? Uh, no. Were you needing to make a reservation, or...? Oh yes, you distracted me. What's the availability for the 16th? We were actually full that weekend from sports teams, so I said, We're actually sold out that weekend. Are your dates flexible? They are. What about the 23rd? We actually do have the availability. The rate is $74. Does that include the price of drinks for you and your boyfriend? I'm sorry? I want to take you and your boyfriend out to dinner. Uh, no thanks. Come on, we're coming in town for a party. We want you guys to come. We're a really great group of people. You'll have so much fun. No thank you. We're not really party people. Well, I'll be honest. It's not a normal party. We're swingers. Okay. Have you ever been interested in being with another man and having your boyfriend watch? What? No. Wow. So he must be a 10 all round, huh? Yeah, he's great. Perfect, actually. So he's a 10? Yeah, absolutely. So he's 10 inches? Excuse me? You said he's 10 all round. Is he 10 inches? He continued to say very explicit things. I was so shocked that a stranger would actually ask me this during a first time conversation that I didn't even know what to say. I also didn't have a boyfriend at the time, but 10 inches 
My soul couldn't handle the weight of that question. He could sense my shock. I bet you're bright red right now. I'm not. I mean, I'm black. So that's not even a thing that happens to us. But I don't think that's an appropriate question. And I'm going to have to hang up now. Okay, Ayana. I'll call back soon. So stranger on the phone, please do not call me back. This is a long one, but it was so bizarre I think it's worth telling. I wanted to post it because this person recently tried to friend my now husband on Facebook and it brought back crazy memories and I need to vent it out. I got married right at 18. I was a pretty book smart kid, but lacked street smarts. By the time I turned 20, my ex-husband and I had moved into a rental property in a pretty nice suburb outside Chicago. In the basement of that house was a big mother-in-law suite where a good male friend of ours, Nick, lived as well. I was about halfway through nursing school at this time. This particular semester of nursing school, I had a very early clinical rotation once a week. I was 21 at the time. I am not a morning person. So in order to maximize the amount of time I spent asleep, I started loading all my stuff into my car the night before. Bags, books, and even my purse. Again, lacking street smarts. One particular night before clinicals, I asked my ex-husband Bobby to go get a book from my car. Bob does, but forgets to lock the door. The next morning when I get to my car, I note that my purse is gone. I ended up filing a police report. I was most concerned because I had just gotten this new job as nurse's aide at a hospital and I had my social security card still sitting in my wallet. Almost immediately after the theft, strange things start to happen. We started getting ding-dong ditches all hours of the day and night. Someone vandalized mine, Nick's, and Bob's cars with strange graffiti. They egged our house and slashed Nick's tires. We first chalked it up to neighborhood pranksters, but when we started having damages that cost some decent money, we called the police. Not to mention one day when Bob was mowing the lawn, he noticed piles of cigarette butts outside the bedroom window. The police came out, pretty much did nothing but take a report, and then told us to perhaps invest in car alarms and some brighter floodlights for the driveway. A few weeks after this, at 2.30 in the morning, I get a call on my cell. It was the police in a neighboring town. They had picked someone up who had my ID on him. Someone named Craig J. When they asked why he had someone else's ID on him, he claimed I was his girlfriend. The cops called me because my name popped up that I'd filed a police report for theft. I assured the cops I'd never heard of him before and I was told that I could pick up my ID at the police station within the next few days. Things really started to escalate at that point, but I still didn't make the connection that perhaps these incidents were related. I started getting strange messages on MySpace, as well as on Facebook, from clearly fake accounts, with long-winded messages that made no sense. This person started messaging friends of mine as well, I deleted MySpace and blocked the person on Facebook, but new accounts kept getting created. Somehow this person got my email address and started sending me emails as well. I had no idea who this person could be, but they seemed to know details about me that indicated that this was either someone I knew or knew someone I knew. The messages weren't overtly threatening, but creepy enough to where I started becoming uncomfortable. One night, my friend Lauren and I were sitting on the couch watching TV. Bob, Lauren's husband, and a few other friends had gone out for the night. As we're sitting around chilling, we hear something that sounds like someone shaking the garage door. I go and check the garage. Nothing seems out of the ordinary. 
We had occasional issues with raccoons, so I chalked it up to that. But the noises keep continuing. Lauren and I are getting freaked out at this point. Now, understand the layout of the house. It was a modern style ranch house with no upstairs. The garage sounds now move to the kitchen window, a distinct sound of someone knocking or scratching hard on the windows. We call our husbands, who did not answer. It was at this point we now debate calling the police. What if it's an animal, or the tree branches? We don't want to seem stupid. As we debate, I see Lauren's face go sheet white and look past me. I spin around and I can see the fortunately locked handle to the front door wiggling. We were seated near the kitchen. We jump up. Lauren grabs a knife from the butcher block on the counter. I grab a small hammer from the junk drawer. We book it to the back of the house where the bedrooms are, cell phone in hand, and lock ourselves in one of the bedrooms, and we call the police. The dispatcher tells us to stay on the line, move furniture in the front of the door if possible, and the police are on their way. We shove a dresser in front of the door, knife and hammer in hand. We agreed if this person was going to come in, he might be bigger or stronger than us, but we're not going down without a fight. We plan. If he gets in before the cops, I go for the head with the hammer, she goes for the gut with the knife. Cops show up, banging on the front door, shouting, Police! We can see the red and blue lights through the window. We leave the room, let the cops in. They find no signs of anyone present, or evidence of an attempted break-in. They take a report. In the meanwhile, our husbands finally call us back. They come home and the cops leave. Flash forward a few months, a very close friend of ours, Sean, was renovating his apartment and needed a place to crash along with his girlfriend. Bob and I decided he could stay in the third bedroom in our house. The first night Sean stays with us, we are awoken at two in the morning by Sean screaming at someone. Bob and I jump out of bed and rush into the hall, and then to Sean's room. Sean and his girlfriend are wide awake, lights on, looking totally freaked out. The screen is sliced and flapping in the wind. Sean told us he woke up to someone using what he thought was a knife on the screen and started climbing in through the window. We call the cops. They come out and take a statement. Sean describes the guy as best as he could. A white male, young looking, semi-shaved head and what looked like darker hair. Cops dust for fingerprints. The prints come back and they match Craig J's prints. Turns out, I knew who he was, vaguely. He was a year younger than me, and we'd gone to the same high school, but I couldn't remember having any significant interactions with him. He lived with his parents, only a few blocks away from my parents' house. Upon realizing that Sean had just moved in, the cops make a statement that showed us all. He probably didn't realize anyone was staying in this bedroom, and he thought the room would be empty. Cops go over to his and arrest him. He suddenly has quite the story for them. Him and I were secret lovers. I was ignoring him. We had a relationship. He also said he had been allowed into my home many times. I am floored. He gets charged with something like trespassing or breaking and entering. He does a light time for it. Maybe like a month. And has to pay a fine. In the meanwhile, I get a restraining order on him. He gets out and I hear nothing from him. I also develop a completely irrational fear of first floor windows. Around Christmas of 2010, I am now 23. I figure the whole Craig thing is in the past. Bob and I decide to divorce and go our separate ways. And Nick has long since moved out. We end the lease. I moved to a less desirable suburb, but with affordable rent. I settled on an apartment in a four-unit building that had a locked entrance, and the only way in was with a key or with someone opening the door from the inside. I lived on the second floor. By this time, I had graduated and was now a nurse. 
I was working now at a nursing home. In the late spring to early summer of 2011, it all started up again. Calls came through to me at work, only to have someone immediately hang up. Letters suddenly appeared in the staff-only mailbox, mailed to me with no return address. The strange email started up again from random accounts. These messages were never overtly threatening, but they were long, way too frequent and way too out there. He spoke to me as if we were long-lost friends and had some sort of connection. I don't think he ever threatened to hurt me, although the cutting into the house with a knife. I don't know what was going through his mind. What I kind of seemed to piece together over the years from all of his ramblings is that he had some sort of crush on me when I was younger, and him happening to rob my car was some sort of sign from the universe or something, that we were meant to be together. I call the cops. They basically tell me that because there have been no threats, there's not a whole lot they can do except watch and wait. This goes on for a while, and finally, one night I wake up at two in the morning to the doorbell ringing. I am instantly in a panic. I go to look out the window, and there, illuminated by the floodlight, is Craig. I burst out crying. In my half-awake state, I run across the hall and start banging on my neighbor's door. He was an older divorced guy who lived alone. He goes downstairs, confronts Craig, and tells him the cops have been called. Craig takes off. I file a report. They claim they will talk to him, but this only makes things worse. Friends I have on Facebook now start getting random messages from Craig, asking about me, telling them he has important information for me. Other times he alternates, saying that I owe him money, and I have debt that I need to pay off. My friends block him as he goes along. Meanwhile, my youngest sister is living in the city with a few friends. He somehow finds out where, and drives to her apartment and confronts her while she has people over. She freaks out. They kick him out and she calls the cops, who basically state again that he didn't commit a crime, but they offer her a restraining order. Right after this, another incident. My younger cousin is a high school senior on the cross-country team. He shows up at my cousin's practice. My cousin has no clue who he is. He starts demanding information on me, and then the coach gets involved. Craig gets into a fight with the coach. The cops are called. He's banned from the school grounds, but nothing more. He calls the nursing home administrator at my job, asking him to talk to me, and that he has important information to tell me. The administrator, who is full aware of the situation, tells him not to come onto the property, or he will have him arrested for trespassing. At this point, I'm paranoid beyond measure, and then, just as quickly as it started, it faded off. It's now summer of 2012 and the final capper in this saga. I'm almost 25 now. A friend of mine named Stacy, and incidentally Sean's ex, moved in with me temporarily while she looked for a place. She was dating a new guy and spent quite a few nights at his place. One day, I picked up a double shift, starting at 7am and ending at 11.30pm. Stacy texts me around 3.30pm stating she won't be home that night, and was going out with her guy. I arrive home at almost midnight. First thing I notice is that the door is unlocked. Uneasy, but thinking perhaps Stacy had just forgotten to lock it, I cautiously peer inside. I pan my gaze to the kitchen and living room, and I can't shake the feeling that I'm unsettled. Something wasn't sitting right due to all these incidents. I always made sure that one or two lights were on, even when we weren't home. I was still not even fully in the door when I noticed that I was staring into a pitch black apartment, and immediately my brain went into full on panic, and I'm glad it did. Realistically, Stacy could have forgotten to leave a light on, but my instincts were in overdrive and sounding off five alarm bells. My Puerto Rican neighbor who lived in one of the building units was known for his weekend parties, and I could hear a party going on downstairs. 
I book it down the stairs and bust into the party. I tell him what happened. He looks at me like I'm crazy, but agrees to come upstairs with me. We get inside and he looks around. We see nobody. I'm starting to wonder if I'm just nuts. Maybe Stacy had a boyfriend over and they left in a hurry, forgetting to turn on the low lights and lock the door. He agrees with me and sort of jokingly pulls open the pantry door. What I saw next will never, ever leave my mind. There, crouched inside, is Craig. My neighbor puts the guy in a chokehold. I call the police. To this day, I have no idea what he planned on doing. The cops come out and he's arrested. Because my neighbor was having a party, he had opened the door to the alleyway. Chances were he just walked into the building and people would just assume he was there for the party or whatever. It's more confusing how he got into the apartment itself. My theory is, my roommate at the time was from the country. While I lived in a suburb, it was the type of suburb right on the edge of a major US city, so we always locked our doors, and generally kept everything secure as a rule. She was used to leaving her doors unlocked and wide open, and I think honestly, it may have just slipped her mind when she went out the front door for the night. I confronted her about it, and of course she denied it. But that's really the only logical way he could have gotten in. I always lock both the knob lock and the deadbolt whenever I left the house. Unless he was a skilled locksmith, I have no idea how he could have gotten in. I didn't stay alone or go anywhere by myself for a long time after that. I feel that I actually developed a paranoia because of all this, and was highly suspicious of giving my number or any information out to anyone. He ended up being charged and convicted of aggravated stalking, breaking and entering, and some other charges. I did meet his parents in court, who were both, shockingly, very normal, apologetic people. They tried explaining their son. After he served time, I did not hear from him for years, until 2016 when he found me on Facebook. I was much older now, around 29. I replied to him very firmly that any contact would end up in the police being called and that I had no interest in him at all. I blocked him in any way I could. Recently, he found my new husband on Facebook and friended him. He blocked him as well. To this day, I still have paranoia. I parked my car near a baseball diamond once, and some kids most likely hit a baseball into my windshield and took off, because I had a perfectly baseball-sized spider crack on the glass. Despite it being completely logical that it was most likely a ball, I instantly thought to myself, oh god, is he back? I have no idea what happened to him. I am also now a total psycho about keeping things locked. Twice my life got screwed up because my doors weren't locked. I have an acquaintance monitor him on Facebook, and from what I have seen, he appears to go through periods where he is pretty inactive, and then episodes where he is rambling, overposting, oversharing, and acting generally deranged. I believe his parents were telling the truth when they stated when he's on his medication, he's okay. Part of me feels bad for him. I'm older now, and I've been nursing for almost 10 years, some of which time was spent in a psych specialty. The mind is a hell of a thing. Looking back though, those were some of the worst years in my adult life. He put me through a lot of anxiety and caused a lot of issues for me. I slept with my couch pushed against my apartment door for the next two years before I moved out of there. I am now married, but on nights where I am home alone, I still find myself resisting the urge to stack furniture in front of the doors. And one of the other fallout from this situation is, Craig either sold, lost, or gave away my social security card that had been in my purse. Someone had tried to file for Medicaid benefits in Arizona using my name and social, as well as obtained a job using my social and failed to pay any taxes leaving me with a surprise asset freeze by the IRS and a whole financial mess that needed to be untangled. 
before they unfroze my accounts and paid me back the money they started to pull out of my paychecks for the back taxes I had nothing to do with. My credit got extremely messed up for years because of it, and to this day, I have a lock on my social security number and monitor my accounts like a hawk. The moral of the story, never leave your purse in the car and always lock your doors. For anyone who is dealing with a stalker or strange occurrences, involve law enforcement. It infuriates me to see that people don't call the police or don't tell anyone until later on. No. Call them. They might not be able to help right away, or you may feel stupid, but you need that paper trail. Over time, stalkers get desperate and stupid, and they will try something extreme. When they do, you need that evidence. You can save your own life, or the life of someone else, if they try it with another person. So when I was 15, my mom was friends with a man who wanted to date her, Jake. My mom was not interested in a relationship with this man at all, and in fact, was dating another guy, Colt. My family is full of pretty serious rednecks, and my mom is no exception. So one day, my mom invited Colt and his roommate, Frank, over to shoot some guns at our home range. We shot for a while and eventually went in around dark. So my mom and Colt got drunk after we went in. Frank cannot drive due to some serious brain damage, so they ended up staying the night at the house. Around 2am, I was still up playing video games. Mom and Colt were in her room asleep when Frank comes running down the hallway, saying a truck had just pulled into the driveway. I look out the window and see it's Jay. Apparently my mom hadn't messaged him in a few hours, and he's extremely possessive, so he came by to check and see if she was home. Keep in mind, Colt's Ranger was parked in the driveway. It is very obviously a guy's truck. Jake absolutely flips. He starts ringing the doorbell non-stop, beating on the door, walking around the house beating on the windows, screaming my mom's name, and circling Colt's truck. At this point, my mom and Colt are awake, and since we have blackout curtains, she tells us to keep the lights off and hide in the hallway, and if we don't do anything or respond, he'll think no one's home and leave. Colt, being completely sober now, is understandably pissed, threatening to go out and deal with it. It is now important to point out the size difference between Colt and Jay. Colt is 5'5 five five and 125 pounds. Jake is 6'3 and 240. Jake could punt Colt 50 feet if he wanted to. Because of this, my mom forces Colt to stay inside. This went on for 45 minutes. At one point, we see on the camera monitor in my mom's room that Jake has punched the side of Colt's truck. Then we hear the screen to one of the windows slide up. The window in question is locked, and Jake couldn't fit through it anyway, thank God. It is at this point that I think of the only thing that will make Jake leave. I grab a gun, act terrified, which at this point I was, and I walk into the living room and ask, who the hell is it, out the window. Jake realizes it's me and asks where my mom is. I tell him that she's out with her friends and I don't know where they are and I'll call him when she gets home if I'm away. He says thank you and left. After all the shit he did, that's all it took for him to leave. And honestly, I was amazed. I genuinely thought I was going to have to shoot him. Later on that night, around four, we hear his truck outside again. He squeals his tires down the road, obviously pissed that mom still hasn't called him. The next morning, he's back again at 10, again beating on the doors and windows, screaming and trying to get a reaction. 
Colt again tries to go out and handle it, but Mom won't let him. He finally leaves again, and Colt goes out to look at his truck. There is a three inch deep dent in the side of his bed. Colt is understandably pissed, and tells my mom to let him know if that creep comes back. Jake had beat on all of our doors until his hands bled, and had blood on the doors and windows. My mom wouldn't let me call the police because she felt it would just cause unnecessary strain and that she thought it was over. So the cops were unfortunately not involved. She was also worried he'd do worse if the police were called. My mom stopped talking to Jake after that day and I never felt comfortable in that house at night again. Once I started driving, I didn't stay the night there very much, opting to visit during the day and go back to my dad's at night. So I take my dad's ashes up to Glacier National Park every year. I lived in Colorado when this story happened, and I was headed south through Idaho after I had visited Montana. My car broke down in Salmon, Idaho, and a nice man helped me out. I was headed through the mountains to Boise to visit a friend. It was about a five hour drive before I entered the truly mountainous section of Idaho. I saw a hot spring on the side of this two lane highway along Salmon River. I decided to take a dip after the stress of having my car breaking down. The hot spring had a bathhouse up at the top near the road and a wheelchair ramp that went down to the area near the springs where they were on the side of the river. People had created little bath shaped sections in the river that were separated by river stones. Actually, you could sit in a spot that was shaped like a hot tub so that it held the water from the hot springs while the river rushed over it. I got out of my car and headed down to the hot springs. I took my dog with me. It was twilight. About every half hour, a car passed by. Knowing that I was alone, essentially, I took off my shirt. I was sitting in the hot spring and actually took a photo of a car approaching. The car pulled up next to mine in front of the bathhouse. It was a truck with three men in it. Seamlessly, one man got out of the driver's side and the two men got out of the passenger side. They moved without qualms and were covered in heavy black gear. They looked like hunters. I couldn't see the expressions on their faces. The driver headed down the wheelchair ramp towards me, not hesitating. He took big long strides. I recognized that there was danger. The two passengers from the other side of the car headed down the steep bank along with the wheelchair ramp, taking a shortcut. I was stuck in between both parties. Hastening, I hid and dressed myself under the water while my dog growled. He never growls. I've only heard him growl like this twice in my life, and this was the second time. The driver kept walking towards me, he walked out onto the rocks into the river, continuously walking towards me even though he was covered in heavy gear that could get him waterlogged if he fell in the river. The other two passengers from the side of the car were also walking out on the rocks, directly in front of me. The driver got so close that I had to grab my dog before he lashed out at the river. I was freaking out. The man was walking out onto the stones so he could reach me. He was not hesitating. I couldn't see his face. I grabbed my phone, my keys, and my clothes. I dragged my dog in between the two parties, my heart in my ears. The driver would not stop. He turned around very quickly, making an arc, still coming for me. He was taking big strides. The passengers were walking towards me as well. I was trapped in between them. I ran up the bank, dragging my dog pretty much by his collar all the way to my car. The only way that I could get into my car without them grabbing me was by throwing my dog into the back and then lunging myself into the passenger side door of my car. I threw the keys into the ignition and turned them right when the men were walking up between my car and their car. 
I happened to hit the lock button on the door right when they walked up, before anything else or before I saw their faces. I ended up throwing myself into the driver's seat, reversing my car and hightailing it out of there. I drove about 20 minutes down the road. I crossed the river on a bridge and hid my car behind a bank near other campers. It was well hidden from the main road. The campers were looking at me, wondering what was going on. I sat and waited. Another 10 minutes passed by and lo and behold, the truck drove by. The hunters were looking for me. I managed to wait another half an hour and then drove up to the mountains, over to Boise and into safety. What you're about to hear is real. The events happened and I still to this day don't understand it and I don't expect you to either. I work in a well-known clothing retail store in the UK and I work in the stock room as part of the delivery and stock team. About two or three weeks before Christmas, 2014 maybe, in between, I had asked my store manager if I could work some overtime to get more money for Christmas presents, and she thought this was a smart move. As my stockroom manager was out of the country on holiday for a week, visiting family. Nearing to Christmas, the deliveries get pretty big, almost three times the size of regular deliveries, so there was work available for me to come in and complete. It would involve stripping clothes from packets and hanging them within the stockroom. My manager had asked that rather than come in on a day I don't usually work, that I should instead stay for additional hours past my contracted ones, which meant that I had to lock up. My manager had trusted me to do this, as I've worked there for almost three years now, so she handed me her master key. The only other master key was with my stockroom manager, who was currently out of the country. This is where it begins. The time was nearing around 8pm at night. All of my colleagues had left the building and I had locked the door after them, turned off the store music and secured the bottom loading bay. I was in the stockroom on the second floor putting some hangers on the racking so that I can use them for the next delivery. I was stood underneath a puppy teddy that was stuffed between a pipe and a wooden piece of racking facing me. The teddy was an old toy from a delivery that was left behind and my colleagues had given it a name. I can't really remember the name, because the teddy isn't really spoken much of. It just sits there. My iPod was plugged into a pair of speakers that had been in the stockroom since ever. I was happily completing my tasks, until I heard a noise. Yes, that might sound cliche, but this noise was very familiar to my ears and it was the noise of the bottom loading bay shutters being opened. I thought someone must be in the store, as the only way to open and shut them is from a panel next to them, from the inside. So I paused my music and proceeded to walk down the stairs, out back to the bottom loading bay. It was when I was about halfway down, the noise suddenly stopped. What I can say that always creeps me out about the place is that the lighting around the corridors, staircases, and stock rooms were lit up by strip lights. And these strip lights had sensors on them, so whenever you walked under one, you'd hear a small click, and then it would come on. So there I was, gliding down the stairs. Click, click, click. I burst into the loading bay, expecting to see one of my colleagues and lo and behold, it was empty. The shutters were shut. I embraced a shutter down my spine and simply turned around and paced back to my workstation in the stockroom. I illuminated the strip lights and continued to hang some more hangers, the music from my iPod playing, calming my nerves, until I remembered that I turned my iPod off. 
I spun around horrified and just stared at my iPod over on the shelf. As I took a breath and shook my head, I caught a glimpse, a glimpse of where the teddy should have been sitting. I was drenched with panic and took a step back to look further down the stock room, about a hundred yard stretch where I had suspected a corporate had fled, only to face darkness. I stood for a moment, still bewildered by what had just unfolded, when I heard a faint click. I instantly moved to my right to get a good look down the stock room, but yet, I still faced darkness. Click. Click, click, was all I heard, gradually getting louder, closer. That's when Pavlov's theory kicked in, and I realized no lights were switching on in sync with the click. No light switched on at all. I turned to the door to see my only exit route, then spun my head around back to be greeted with a dark figure in the distance. The figure was big what I can only describe as perhaps a bodybuilder male. I need glasses for long distance things and usually only wear them in the cinema or at football games anyway. The darkness didn't help. Within his hand I could see a small object, although when the hand clutched at it I could make out that it was the teddy. This is when I felt adrenaline, screamed then ran. Out of the stock room, down the corridor, through two doors and to my right, straight into the ladies' toilets, opposite the two offices. I ran straight into one of the four cubicles, the middle one, and locked myself in. I crouched on the toilet and shaking, partly because I'm a tall guy, and partly because my heart was hammering in my ears, putting me off balance. The doors of the toilet took a while to close slowly as they should, and I listened out for anybody who might be approaching. The doors shut closed, which gave me a little relief, and I stopped and blinked, thinking for a moment. I wiped the sweat off my brow with my left forearm. As my head turned to meet my arm, I glanced down at the bottom of the cubicle. Her face was there. The face was pulling away underneath, just as I caught a glimpse of the mouth and nose. My only description is that the teeth were black and seemed slightly bloody from a self-inflicted wound, and by the grayish skin tone and wrinkles, the person was old. I was injected with pure fear when I screamed fuck off, and I kicked the door, making it shake and slam, echoing around the walls in a thunder. I swung the door open, looked back, took a deep breath and braced myself before darting out of the toilets to the front of the store. I was charging along, prepared to attack anything to save my life from injury, yet nothing stood between me and the front door. I unlocked it with shaking hands and ran outside. I knew I had left my coat and iPod inside, but I was eager to get out. Locking the sliding doors behind me, I turned the key inside the lock and the shutters were descending. The store shutters were on the inside of the store, just past the alarms, and as I crouched there slowly watching the shutters come down, again, I witnessed the figure, still holding the teddy in the middle of the shop floor. It was dark outside, and it was dark inside. I closed my eyes and begged the shutter to hurry. As it hit the floor, I snatched the keys out and ran down the road to the high street. My phone was in my pocket, where it's always kept, so I called the police and told them what happened. I told them I believed the mail had broken in. The police arrived shortly, and I let them into the store. I had them escort me to the office to turn the lights on, and as I reached the office, I noticed the computer was on. I told them this wasn't on before, but they sped me up to turn the lights on so they could search the store. After towing them around the store to search, even the lift, they found nobody and told me to go home. The officers said they would contact my manager tomorrow. The next day I arrived at work at opening time, even though I wasn't scheduled to work. 
I was greeted by different officers and my store manager. We proceeded to go to the office just after my manager had opened the store and let my colleagues set up. The officer said they would continue a search that day and night again, and that my manager should ask for CCTV to be installed. I walked to the stockroom to get my iPod and coat before leaving, when one last stab of fear hit me when I glanced at the teddy, stuffed back into its usual spot. I was allowed two contracted days off that week to rest. I think my manager thought I was seeing things and needed to sort myself out. I returned to work as usual. I was happy to do so as it was within the daytime and the store was full of people. Nothing has happened since. I still don't know how it was possible or what happened. If it was a prank if someone had motive. Some people think I'm crazy. Some think it might be a group. Hey all, it's your family neighborhood repo man. I begrudgingly earn a living repossessing bank collateral in the form of motor vehicles. As you can probably guess, most people I deal with are not happy to see me. For some background, I'm not your typical repo man by looking at me. Most guys I work with are over six foot three, two to three hundred pounds, bald with a beard. I know it sounds specific but it really holds true in my experience. I, on the other hand, am 5'11", 155 pounds, but I do have a beard. And now to the story. I was out working during the day and checking a retail location for a vehicle I'd been searching for. The address I was checking was located in a large mall area. I glanced in my rearview mirror to see a red Ford Focus behind me. He made a few of the same turns I did, but I didn't think twice about it. After the seventh or eighth turn that he mimicked, I decided to pull into a parking spot. I figured he would either move on or come talk to me, if that was his goal. I noticed he was on the phone in my rearview mirror. I parked the truck and watched the car as it parked about 50 feet away from me. Okay, fine. I noticed the man driving the Focus was staring and pointing at me as he spoke on the phone, so I decided to ask what his deal was. When I approached, he got out of his vehicle, which was alarming, so I backed off and didn't get closer. I leaned my head out of my open window and said, Sir, is there any reason you're following me? He moves his phone from his ear, covering the microphone, and yells, Yes, you're harassing people on private property. The cops are on their way. I told him that was fine and I would wait around to speak with the police. He yelled some more unintelligible nonsense as I put up my window and sat pretty waiting for the police. A few minutes later, a cruiser shows up behind me. The officer approached my window and we spoke about the situation. I told him I'm permitted on private property unless I'm explicitly asked by someone to leave, who either owns the property or works security, which he agreed with. Long story short, the police told me I was good to go and asked that I not engage this man as I left. I complied and planned to move on with my day. About 20 minutes after all of this, I glanced in my rear view to see the same focus driving a couple of cars behind me. So, I parked again. Out of frustration, I immediately exited my truck and lit a cigarette. The man driving this car screeched up beside me and exited his car without putting it in park rather putting it in neutral. As his car begins to roll away, he's turned away from it, screaming at me about violating his right to privacy and harassing the public at this mall. I calmly told him that I was already cleared by the PD and that I was losing patience. I told him he needed to leave right then before I called the police. It was at this point that his vehicle struck the concrete base of a light pole and stopped. He started screaming and saying I crashed his car. I told him I had dash cam footage that would negate the claim. That's when he charged me. Now remember, I'm not a big guy, but I've dealt with plenty of confrontation at this job, and this guy did not appear to coordinate at all. I stepped out of his path and guided him to the ground, 
telling him to stay down while I leave and to leave me alone. I got in my truck and left. Looking back, I absolutely should have called the police again as I've gotten the officer's cell phone number and badge number. This story all comes to a head two nights later in a bizarre turn of events that genuinely scared me. At this time, I had just gotten married to my lovely wife. We were living in our little one bedroom in our hip little suburb of a major Midwest city. It was a Friday night and I decided I would grab some beers for the wife and I to enjoy after a long week. As I was leaving the store with our booze, I saw a maroon Ford Focus in the parking lot, seemingly unoccupied. I made a mental note of the coincidence, given the bizarre ordeal a couple days prior, but I didn't think much of it. As I pulled into my apartment's parking lot, the Focus pulled in behind me. I hadn't noticed it following me up until this point. I live on the third floor, so I decided I was going to hustle up the steps, just in case it was the same guy and he'd stalked me or something in order to exact his revenge for whatever perceived transgression I bothered him with. My plan didn't work. He followed me to my patio where my wife was waiting, again unbeknownst to me. I was apparently not feeling very observant that night. That's when this man snuck up, crouching behind our small fence. Neither of us knew he was there until he said, still hidden from view, pretty girl. I snapped to my feet and began to look around when I spotted him. I knew instantly it was him. I immediately ordered my wife to go inside, lock the door, and call the police. When I approached him, he drew a small switchblade and pointed it right at my belly. I began to back up with my hands up, saying something along the lines of, We don't have to do this. What do you want? He told me he wanted me to call my wife back outside but that wasn't going to happen. I'd rather be stabbed than expose her to this man, so I told him as much. He lunged at me with a knife, grazing and cutting my side as I attempted to grab and redirect his forearm. Then he went to the ground where he lost his knife. I got some knees to connect to his head when the police lights became visible, and I heard shouting. Long story short, Buddy was arrested on sight and I provided the badge number and PD of the officer from work a couple of days prior in order to corroborate my claims. I decided to press charges, and as far as I know, he's awaiting a court date. I'm sure I'll have to be involved with it. So crazy stalker guy, don't mess with my wife. So my husband, Ted, is in the military. We have generally lived on base every station we've been to because the surrounding towns can be very crime-ridden and sketchy. And with my husband gone most of the time, the extra security is appreciated. I work from home due to us moving so often, so one afternoon I was taking a break. I had made myself a bite to eat and was snuggling up on the couch with my dog. That's when I heard the sliding glass door open. It was so nonchalant I thought it was Ted. I saw my cat run from the kitchen and a shadow standing near the door entering it. I thought maybe he'd come back for something, so I called out for him and was like, What are you doing home? Did you forget something? No answer. This is where I just got an eerie feeling. After I asked what he was doing here, I saw the shadow move and heard the click of the sliding door lock. From there, he walked to the laundry room and shut the door. I still had received no response, so I'm sitting on the couch scared out of my mind and I call my husband hoping to hear his phone in the laundry room. I don't hear a ring, but he answers. I asked him why he came home and didn't answer me, and all he says is, that wasn't me. Grab the dog and get in your car. I freak. After getting off the phone with Ted, I grab the dog and run to my car. From there, I call the military police. Waiting for them was probably the longest 20 minutes of my life. When I got there, they cleared the house and found no one. 
They asked me to make a statement, and even they were baffled that someone would try this on base. We still live here. I am so scared he will come back. For context, I was young, maybe 18 to 19, and had no idea what we were getting into. So my father owns three businesses, and was actively dating his business partner, and was providing for her. She also made advances on me, which kind of creeped me out. She would buy us all food, and at first I was grateful, but then I started becoming nervous as she wanted to be alone with me a lot. My father ended up getting married, but didn't tell her, and she got really upset at him. He told me not to tell her. She came to my job and demanded to see my father, to which I told her he wasn't there. She screamed at me and said we would soon regret it. Due to the disturbing nature of it, I called the cops, and all they did was take my name, but didn't actually look into it. So fast forward, I come home around 12 midnight, as I had just come from my second job. Dead tired from school and work, I ate and crashed on my bed. It had to be at least three in the morning when I heard my door open. At first, I didn't move, because I assumed it was my calico cat, Misty, pawing at my door, and as she liked to sleep with me. When I groaned her name, and she didn't answer, it struck me as strange, but I wasn't worried until I felt a presence standing over me. I quickly woke up and discovered my father's ex in our house, above me. Crazy-eyed, she was screaming, saying how she would get her revenge on my father. I quickly rolled out of bed past her and called the authorities. She openly tried to fight my father's wife and tried to stab my dad. The police came and arrested her on the spot. That was the scariest shit I've ever been through and I'm glad I won't see her again. Now, I sleep with a blade next to my bed and a taser. Please be careful, as you never know who may pay you a late night visit. This happened a couple of years ago, back when I was a dancer at a gentleman's club in Virginia. It was the most upscale place in the city, but it still more or less catered to regular clientele. There was a man named George, who used to come in and see me a couple times a week. He'd buy dances in VIP rooms, and always tip me really well, while saying things like, I can't believe you don't have a boyfriend. When are you going to let me take you out to dinner? Thing is, I did have a boyfriend. However, much like my real name, my personal life is not anyone's business, and strip clubs are a fantasy environment. If these men knew that I had a boyfriend and life outside of dancing for them, I probably wouldn't have made as much money as I did. One night, I was getting dressed to leave, and I was excited to get home as my boyfriend had just come back from the tour he was on and was waiting at home for me. The club closed at 2am, so I was usually walking out the door and to my car at around 2.30am. Usually we have a bouncer walk us out, but since it was a slow night, we only had one bouncer still on the clock, and he was off doing something. I was in a hurry, so I just ran to my car alone. As soon as I started my car and turned out of the parking lot, another car turned its lights on and pulled out behind me. I didn't think too much of it and continued on my way home, until I realized that every turn I made, the car also made. He followed me onto the highway and then onto my exit. My boyfriend and I lived on the outskirts of the city in a heavily wooded area, where houses are pretty few and far between. So as soon as the car took the same exit onto the gravel road that leads to the area my house is in, I called my boyfriend. Now, my boyfriend at the time was a really big guy, 
and he had a really bad temper. As soon as I pulled into our drive, with the other car still behind me, he ran out from behind his tour van with a baseball bat and two of our dogs following close behind. He told me to stay in my car, so I was trying to see who was following me without actually getting out. And of course, it was George. My boyfriend managed to hit the hood of his car with the bat before George could reverse down the gravel road and disappear. I was scared because he knew where I lived now, but my boyfriend assured me that there was nothing to worry about anymore and he had most likely adequately deterred George from ever coming back. I mean, I guess a huge tattooed guy with a baseball bat and two giant pit bulls is a pretty good deterrent. I told the managers at work about the incident the next day and they banned George from the club. A couple of months later, he had tried to come in, but the bouncers had stopped him, and his only explanation was, I thought she didn't have a boyfriend.